Up next, a hearing on mandatory seafood inspection before the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. Witnesses included representatives of the National Fisheries Institute, the National Marine Fisheries Service, the National Wildlife Federation, and the Public Voice for Food and Health Policy. The subcommittee is chaired by Representative John Dingell of Michigan. Committee will come to order. This is the beginning of a hearing and a series of hearings on the subject of consumer safety, food and drug responsibility, fish and fish safety, safety of consumers from possible contamination of fish, the ability and the activity of the government to protect consumers from possible supplies of contaminated fish and the legislative structure of the American statutes with regard to dealing with these matters, as well as the regulatory capabilities and regulatory authorities of agencies under the jurisdiction of this subcommittee, most specifically the Food and Drug Administration. Committee notes that consumption of fish has been rising steadily in the United States since World War II. Americans are apparently growing to like the idea of an alternative to chicken and beef. So much so that our domestic seafood industry has been unable to supply the quantity and variety of seafood demanded by American consumers. Two thirds of the seafood consumed in the United States is imported. Today the subcommittee will examine whether that fish is safe to eat and whether our fish inspection programs are adequate. The average American may assume that state and federal regulatory bodies have strict health standards which both domestic and imported seafood must meet. This may be true in theory, but unfortunately, in practice, it is not. The inspection system, as it apparently exists today, presently permits large amounts of uninspected fish and shellfish to pass through interstate commerce into the homes of American consumers. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Acts controls the interstate transport of seafood and imports. It also gives the FDA authority over seafood products and nearly 4,000 seafood processing facilities. To do this job, however, FDA has only 125 full-time equivalents called FTEs, employees for assuring seafood safety. In 1987, the Food and Drug Administration inspected only 19% of the seafood plants. States with cooperative agreements inspected an additional 8%. The National Marine Fisheries Service covers only 7% in its voluntary inspection program. Almost two-thirds of our processing plants remain uninspected. Furthermore, today the chair notes with great sorrow that FDA does not have the legal authority to shut down a plant immediately if it, filed, if it finds violations of good manufacturing practices. Because the agency must rely on non-expedited injunctive procedures to close down a facility, weeks may pass before dangerous or unacceptable products can be removed from the marketplace. Of the three billion pounds of edible seafood imported into this country, FDA analyzed 3% in 1988. According to FDA estimates, these samples were in violation as much as 50% of the time. Many were detained for microbial contamination, such as salmonella. The Centers for Disease Control report for the period between 1982 and 1986, a higher incidence of foodborne illnesses attributable to seafood than either meat or poultry. Of 349 confirmed cases of foodborne outbreaks, 56% were attributable to seafood, 23% to beef and pork, and 12% were attributable to chicken and turkey. However, the CDC acknowledges readily that outbreaks and single illnesses associated with bacteria, viruses, and other pathogens were underrated by 95%. Further, the data also points out a startling number of unconfirmed illnesses connected to shellfish. 
the nation does not seem to be well equipped to identify either pathogens associated with shellfish and that we are also unfortunately not well equipped to control the harvest and market of potentially hazardous shellfish possibly coming from heavily contaminated waters. The following examples in illustrate the inability of this nation's current system to adequately protect the consumer from known and unknown health hazards associated with shellfish. For example, in August 1988, 61 cases of hepatitis A were reported in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. The outbreak was caused by oysters illegally harvested from waters in Florida which were closed because of pollution. FDA Region 4 reported 14 outbreaks of Vibrio vulnificus associated with raw or steamed oysters. This bacteria has an estimated mortality rate exceeding 50% for certain individuals who are not properly protected. Yet the current requirements for classification of shellfish waters affords little or no protection against the interstate transportation of these disease-producing bacteria. Neither the National Shellfish Sanitation Program nor the FDA has published guidelines for action levels addressing the limits, prevention, or controls of Vibrio in oysters or shellfish. In Connecticut, FDA officials have reported heavy fecal pollution in areas where there are commercially exploitable quantities of shellfish. The FDA, despite its authority to delist or suspend a state from interstate commerce, has yet to do so. Rather, the FDA has put the state on an interim list, still permitting it to transport shellfish to other states. The FDA reported that during 1988, illegal harvesting in Louisiana has not diminished, and the occurrence of night harvesting in closed areas appears to have escalated. Lately, there has been a flurry of activity to establish a task force on food safety, and special emphasis has been directed at fish and fish safety. The FDA, clearly cognizant of the need to bolster food safety, submitted a budget request to the administration for an additional $14 million for food safety in fiscal year 1990, and it included 232 FTEs. The administration, however, responded by authorizing FDA a mere $1 million and no new personnel to carry out its food safety programs. The level of employees at FDA is clearly inadequate not only to address this problem, but all of the other problems within the jurisdiction of that agency. And it is an appropriate matter of special concern, not only this committee, but the American people. Now, the administration is contemplating housing the task force, which has been just referred to, within USDA an agency at which until just a few weeks ago was proposing drastic reductions in meat and poultry inspection processes. Only public outrage and congressional pressure caused USDA to withdraw its proposal. The aim of the committee today is to demonstrate that the Congress must move forward quickly and vigorously to protect the public health and safety. If the administration will not do so, then the Congress has no choice but to fill the void left by an action downtown. In so doing, the Congress must make sure that the federal agencies work together and that they do not work at cross purposes and that they take steps to ensure that fish are safe and wholesome and also to see to it that other responsibilities in the area of food are and food safety are adequately carried out. The administration supports this program. Uh, the industry does and the Congress will. Today, our witnesses will illuminate some of the key issues that must be addressed through legislation and better administration of current laws and regulations. The chair recognizes a distinguished gentleman from Oregon, Mr. White. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, for going forward with what I think is an extremely uh, important uh, inquiry. It's my view that federal policy for inspecting seafood in this country is fragmented, uncoordinated and confusing at best. And I think it is particularly important that out of these hearings we see legislation developed that has a lead federal agency play a strong role in trying to bring clear new policies uh, to this field. Now some view this debate as really a turf battle between the Food and Drug Administration and the Department uh, of Agriculture. I think that that would be particularly unfortunate if the debate was seen in that light. 
I think that the Food and Drug Administration, which is inspecting uh, fish today, is the proper place to uh, take uh, the lead with respect uh, to federal policy. I think they badly need more resources, and with new resources and strengthened authority, I think they could be the agency uh, that best would take the lead in dealing with this important issue. The second point I would want to mention, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that I think what is being done with respect uh, to seafood imports is woefully uh, inadequate. This is particularly important because 65% of all seafood consumed in the United States is imported from a total of 141 uh, countries. A mention was made, made of the problems of biological contamination from salmonella uh, in imported shrimp, but the one thing that has concerned me is that I don't think the federal government has moved uh, anywhere near aggressively enough to come up with minim minimum standards uh, and memorandums of understanding with uh, importing uh, countries. What we ought to be trying to do is reach uh, these memorandums of understanding to ensure that their minimum uh, quality standards with respect to countries that are importing fish into the United States. And at present, the Food and Drug Administration has memorandums of understanding with only five of 11 foreign countries importing oysters, both fresh and frozen. And of the 20 countries importing fresh clams, only five have memorandums of understanding with the FDA. And it's my view that the FDA ought to be much more aggressive in trying to get these memorandums of understanding with the importing uh, countries so that we would have another opportunity to have minimum quality standards for seafood that is coming into this country. The last point that I wanted to mention, Mr. Chairman, deals with more a, a question that I think warrants exploration than, than anything else, and that is that I think we ought to make a careful analysis of what the states are doing in terms of contingency plans uh, for uh, disasters, such as what happened uh, with the Exxon Valdez, or in an instance where thousands of pounds of toxic uh, chemicals would, say, uh, be released into the Great Lakes or another area. My staff has been in contact with Alaska. I think they have worked very, very hard in terms of trying to deal with their particular uh, problem. But I would hope that our committee would carefully analyze the uh, response or the plans that a state may have to deal with these kinds of, uh, of catastrophes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for uh, the chance to make an opening statement. Look forward to pursuing this inquiry with you. Chair notes that our first panel is a panel composed of Ms. Ellen Haas, Public Voice for Food and Health, Ms. Nancy Ridley, Director, Division of Food and Drugs, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and Ms. Suzanne Montero, Special Agent in Charge, Office of Law Enforcement, National Marine Fishery Service, Regional Office, St. Petersburg, Florida. Ladies, if you would please come forward. Okay. The uh, chair notes that all of our witnesses before the subcommittee are sworn. The chair inquires, ladies, do any of you have any objection to appearing here under oath? The chair, the, the chair is asked, do any of you, do any of you ladies object to appearing here under oath? Not at all. We have a Not terrible loudspeaker system, as you have probably already noted. The chair also observes that uh, it is your right, in view of that, that you be advised by counsel if you choose to during your appearance here. Do any of you desire to appear, uh, to be advised by counsel during your appearance? Very well. For your information to inform you of the powers of the committee, the limitations on those powers and your rights as you appear before you, there are copies of the rules of the subcommittee, rules of the committee, and rules of the House. There before you at the witness table. Ladies, if you have no objection then to appearing under oath, if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help your God. You. you may each consider yourself to be under oath.
Rise and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help your God. You. you may each consider yourself to be under oath. Share notes that we will we will recognize you uh, in this order: Ms. Haas, Ms. Ridley, and Ms. Montero. So, if you will, if you will recognize yourself in that order, we will we will receive your testimony at this time. Ms. Haas. Chairman, I am Ellen Haas, Executive Director of Public Voice for Food and Health Policy. I have a long written statement that I'd like to submit to the, for the record, and I will summarize my remarks. That would be appropriate. The Chair would again ask, in view, in view of the terrible character of this public address system, if you would crowd your microphone, please. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the health risks consumers face from eating contaminated, uninspected fish and the inadequacies of the current federal and state inspection programs that leave consumers vulnerable to acute illness, sometimes death, and the long-term risk of cancer. Since 1983, six months after Public Voice's founding, we have been documenting the problems of fish safety and calling for a mandatory fish inspection program. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, we applaud your concern about the failings of the current programs and for convening today's critical hearing. Thank you. This is the first congressional hearing on seafood inspection since 1974. American consumers of fish and shellfish have been facing an increase in this healthful product. From 1980 to 1987, consumption has gone up 20% to the point that it is now 3 billion pounds. Consumers have been responding to the countless health recommendations, such as the Surgeon General and the National Academy of Sciences, for this low-fat, high-protein source. Yet sadly, this is an irony because of the helpful promise that seafood presents, consumers face unnecessary hazards. It is the only flesh food not subject to a comprehensive, mandatory federal inspection program. And last year's public concern showed up in the marketplace. For the first time in eight years, consumption went down by 2%. The risks that are faced of acute illness from bacteria and parasitic hazards are unique for seafood for several reasons. To begin with, seafood is harvested from uncontrolled environments, which may be polluted with sewage, industrial chemicals, and pesticides. Second, certain types of seafood, like shellfish, um, concentrate contaminants in their tissues. Even when refrigerated, seafood tends to deteriorate quickly, and also it is frequently eaten raw. A summary of, of data from the Center for Disease Control from 1973 to 1987 showed the total number of reported foodborne outbreaks traced to fish actually exceeded the total reported outbreaks traced to beef and poultry combined. What this means is is that we, even though we eat more than four times as much beef and three times as much poultry as seafood, there was significantly more risk from eating seafood. When this is examined, as we have done with recent Department of Agriculture consumption data, the risk of a food poisoning outbreak from eating seafood is actually 10.4% 4 times greater from seafood than beef and 6.9 times greater than for poultry, and 5.8 times greater than for pork. Also, the problems of pesticides and other chemical contaminants present in waterways are more serious for fish than they are for other food products because of industrial and municipal dumping and agricultural runoff. They pose a risk that is very real public health hazard. Of all the domestic food samples collected and analyzed by the Food and Drug Administration, from 1979 to 1985, including fruits, vegetable, and dairy products, fish had the highest percentage of illegal residues, 5.2%, compared to the market basket average of 2.9%. Unfortunately for the public, today's inspection system falls far short in addressing these health risks. It is an inadequate patchwork, often voluntary, of federal and state programs with very weak standards and weaker budgets. For example, the National Marine Fisheries Service of the Department of Commerce operates a voluntary program paid for by the corporate users 
and it covers only 11% of the seafood consumed today. It is not a public health program. It is designed as an industry marketing and promotion tool. And then the Food and Drug Administration, which has the authority to inspect seafood and interstate commerce, but when we look at its record, it is woeful. In 1987, FDA inspected only 789 plants that process fish and seafood. That's only one quarter of the total operating that year. Also, FDA's monitoring of chemical pesticides and contaminants is highly inadequate. In cooperation with the EPA, FDA has established only one tolerance level and 13 action levels, uh, though hundreds of chemicals may pose potential health threats and be in our waters. Also, it tests a minute percentage of fish. In 1987, FDA analyzed only 996 domestic and 628 imported seafood samples, though we ate 3 billion pounds. FDA also has the responsibility for administering the Shellfish Sanitation Program, which is a voluntary program of states. It's critical because shellfish presents the strongest of health risks. But according to FDA's own data in 1988, their annual status report, they found that nine states producing 54% of the shellfish harvest, they cited them for major public health significances. But when FDA wants to do something about it, the only sanction they have available is to withdraw enforcement of a state program. But that sanction has never been used and rarely threatened. American consumers need the protection against these health threats. We recommend the following elements should be part of any mandatory fish inspection program. To begin with, we need to mandate certification of fishing vessels. Second, mandate good manufacturing practices and establish unannounced spot checks of fish processing facilities. Third, we need to establish federal microbiological and chemical standards with meaningful residue sampling programs. Fourth, we need to improve this import program for contaminants. And fifth, establish a traceback and record keeping system for fish. Sixth, we need to increase the enforcement activities for federal officials and strengthen enforcement authorities by means such as civil penalties. Seven, we need to appropriate funding for development of needed test methodology for toxins. And eighth, we need to establish a program to address economic fraud. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of Public Voice and the 35 members of our Coalition for Mandatory Federal Fish Inspection, which include environmental, consumer, public health organizations, we look forward to working with you to close this critical gap in food safety. Without prompt legislative attention, health conscious consumers will continue to face unnecessary risk of serious illness from eating contaminated uninspected fish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Haas. Okay, Ms. Ridley, we recognize you. Get close to that, get close to that microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm quite pleased to be here today to give a state's perspective on chemical and microbiological contamination. And thanks to the fact that between the chairman and Ellen have done an excellent job, and as well as Mr. Wyden, uh, in summarizing a lot of the national problems, I can cut to uh, what some of our problems are specifically in Massachusetts. It's been mentioned that the actual incidence of foodborne illness related to fish and shellfish is quite high in relation to other types of, of uh, uh, muscle type meat products. Well, in Massachusetts, uh, we are running about 20 percent of all of our cases of foodborne illness uh, that are reported to us, and this is both incidents, individual incidents as well as outbreaks are attributable to either fish or shellfish. During 1988 alone, uh, we had 57 cases reported which involved 225 individuals. And the significance here is that uh, it's estimated that well less than 10 percent of all cases actually get reported to state health departments. Uh, this coupled with the fact that it is often very difficult to attribute to a specific etiologic agent exactly what causes individual cases of foodborne illness. Uh, means that there is a significant problem that is probably going unrecognized at this point in time. 
Uh, in my longer remarks, I've identified exactly the types of causes uh, that we have identified for all of the outbreaks. Some of the contaminants obviously occur in the natural environment. Others are the result of post-harvest uh, improper handling practices. We feel that <clears throat> shellfish may also re uh, contaminated shellfish and, and fish may reach the market as a result of um, deficiencies in the operation of state and federal regulatory programs. And a look at the uh, Interstate Shellfish Sanitation Conference uh, slash FDA evaluation program shows that 11 out of 23 of the, of the the states which harvest shellfish, including the state of Massachusetts, I might add, have major deficiencies in their, grow in their programs uh, that are supposed to operate to protect the public's health. Uh, often these deficiencies result from the shortage of personnel and funding. Uh, they are often uh, a result of the lack of coordination and communication between the different agencies that have responsibility for uh, protecting the uh, health of um, the public and may be the result of the absence of methods for adequately assessing uh, the potential human illness causing uh, uh, potentials of contaminated growing waters. I think you're going to hear later about the impacts of bootlegging and specific types of illnesses that are caused. It's clear that better indicator systems are necessary to uh, assess and judge the human illness causing potential of our growing areas uh, for both fish and shellfish. I'm going to attempt to use two recent case studies from Massachusetts, one involving chemical contamination and one involving microbiological contaminants, to describe the jurisdictional and scientific problems and, and uncertainties which exist within as well as between states uh, and the federal agencies such as EPA and FDA. These problems often result in confusion and frustration for both consumers and for the industry who look to state and federal agencies for leadership in identifying health hazards, for implementing corrective actions, and communicating effectively the exact nature of those risks. Uh, in order to understand the nature of the problems faced by uh, state and federal agencies, you have to look first uh, and understand the differences in the, in the various federal and state statutory mandates. And a document that I attached as an attachment to my testimony uh, the EPA FDA summary policy statement on chemical residues in fish and shellfish, which was issued in April of 1988, uh, is an excellent attempt uh, which describes the differences with respect to the federal and state jurisdictions for chemical contaminants. This type of a document is desperately needed for microbiological contaminants as well. The policy document makes it clear that no single agency has the responsibility for assuring the safety of fish and shellfish from harvest to table. Uh, further complications arise when one considers that uniform methods of assessing health risks and making decisions as to how to manage and communicate those risks uh, have not been agreed upon by either the federal agencies or the state agencies which need to uh, utilize these mechanisms for protecting public health. Uh, in my presentation, I've listed a number of factors uh, which, uh, which have caused problems, I think, within federal agencies and state agencies uh, in uh, uh, trying to assure seafood safety. Uh, one of those problems has to do with the fact that certain statutes uh, require that economic impact to the industry be included in all decision making, whereas other statutes are based solely on health and safety considerations. Uh, some statutes affect only products shipped in interstate commerce, while, while others are limited to just the sources of contamination. Very few statutes, uh, even at the state level, affect uh, recreational fishing. Uh, tolerances and action levels for contaminants exist only for a small number of contaminants. Routinely available test methods, particularly those with quick turnaround times, do not exist for the majority of chemical and microbiological contaminants. Uh, indicator standards, such as fecal coliform and standard plate count, uh, in many cases underestimate the pathogenic or human illness causing potential um, of the waters and of the fish, and in other cases may overestimate that potential. Surveillance programs, as I said, are limited due to staffing and, and funding uh, constraints. Uh, communication and cooperation amongst state and federal agencies has not always occurred despite the issuance of policies such as the joint EPA-FDA policy. Uh, significant differences exist between federal and state agencies in assessing human health risks, 
Many of these differences result from the use of very different fundamental assumptions and formulas when calculating health risks or the use of different analytical methods which produce significantly different results when testing a product for suspected contaminants. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, I think what I would like to do is to briefly summarize the two case studies that I think uh, show some of the problems, uh, jurisdictional and scientific problems in Massachusetts, the first being an example of chemical contaminants. And this involves Boston Harbor or Quincy Bay, which I think most people are familiar with as being uh, one of the most, if not the most, contaminated urban embayment uh, in the country. In 1988, the Environmental Protection Agency Regional Office conducted um, an assessment at the request of Congress uh, of the types and concentrations of pollutants in Quincy Bay, the incidence of abnormalities uh, in Quincy Bay marine life, and what were the public health implications of consumption of seafood that were exposed to these contaminated sediments. Various federal, state, uh, and local agencies, including FDA and the Massachusetts Department of Health, participated to varying degrees uh, in the development or review of various aspects of that study. In June of 1988, Mass uh, the uh, EPA, in conjunction with the Massachusetts uh, state agencies, issued um, a report which had in it six major recommendations uh, and seven additional recommendations uh, for next steps that needed to be taken, included, included in this, and the number one recommendation was the issuance of a health advisory uh, by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. This health advisory uh, advised uh, a full uh, abstinence of uh, all segments of the population from consuming lobster tamale, the hepatopancreas of lobsters, and in addition set up a limited advisory for certain susceptible population groups and recommended that uh, infants and young children, pregnant women, uh, the elderly uh, refrain from eating uh, um, all seafood species from the Boston Harbor area. This was felt to be necessary due to a number of different types of findings in the Quincy Bay report. The problem arose about two months after the issuance of the EPA report. The office, the regional office of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, after completing some tests of its own, issued a report directly to the media which contradicted certain parts of the EPA report and contradicted the Massachusetts Health Advisory. The resultant coverage of the dispute between EPA and FDA has resulted in a continuing sequence of media headlines, the most recent, as recent as, as uh, about a month ago, uh, indicating uh, that agencies were still disputing and, 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 and did not agree on the actual nature of health risks. And unfortunately, it's taken away from the significance and real importance that that study was able to contribute to us at the state level and I think to the consumers and public in Massachusetts. Uh, many factors played a, a role, different statutes, different mandates uh, between EPA and FDA in the differing interpretations. Unfortunately, I think the biggest problem uh, was a serious lack of communication. It's clear that the EPA-FDA policy statement, which was designed specifically to improve interactions between the states and federal headquarters uh, on fish contamination issues, should have pre prevented the issuance of conflicting and contradictory reports if it had been adhered to. Unfortunately, in this case, it was not. A subsequent meeting last fall in Washington between headquarters, EPA, FDA, and the state of Massachusetts came up with a listing of uh, next steps that needed to be undertaken jointly between the states uh, and headquarters and the regional offices uh, of the organizations. And I think, unfortunately, to my knowledge, uh, many of these initi initiatives have not yet been implemented. My second case study is on microbiological contamination. Um, in Massachusetts, we perform between 1,500 and 2,000 uh, tests each year for contamination of shellfish. This is fecal coliform and standard plate count. During the last two years, we, along with the states of New Hampshire and Maine, noticed that soft shell clams from the state of Maryland, Chesapeake Bay, were um, coming out with increasingly higher levels of fecal coliform contamination. Usually the contamination level ranges between 8 and 15 percent um, of either shell stock or shucked product that you're looking at. 
Uh, as of the end of last summer, Maryland softshell clams were running approximately 70 percent contamination, and the degree of those uh, violations were uh, as, as high as 100 times the allowable 230 fecal coliform uh, indicator standard. This obviously gave us uh, great concern. Uh, Massachusetts ended up embargoing uh, shellfish from 19 individual firms uh, from the state of Maryland. The, uh, we made a trip to the state of Maryland uh, in August to determine what was the cause of the problem since it did not seem to be resolving itself through the efforts of the state. Uh, it appears that uh, severe environmental conditions, uh, high water temperatures, high air temperatures, uh, low dissolved oxygen, low salinity, coupled with some definitely identifiable uh, post-harvest handling practice problems uh, are undoubtedly the combination of factors responsible for the elevated counts. Uh, it appears that the growing areas, the waters in the state of Maryland are classified in accordance with the current standards for classification of growing waters, but the stress that is put on the shellfish uh, makes them unable to uh, maintain a suitable uh, or allowable or acceptable fecal coliform level. Unfortunately, uh, the, the state of Maryland has taken the position that because the growing areas are in compliance with the standards, the, uh, uh, sh they will not take action on the market standard, which is in the ISSC, the interstate standards, as a guideline as opposed to an official uh, regulation or standard. And even though all of the receiving states are using this standard um, at this point as an acceptable standard for receipt of shellfish, um, we are placed in the uh, position of having as a receiver state to take action as opposed to the state of initiation or origin of the shellfish uh, taking actual action. Now, a question that is often asked is why doesn't FDA or the Interstate Shellfish Conference uh, do something where there is a violation of one of its standards, albeit that it is the, a, a guideline in their, in their um, uh, manual of operations. FDA has taken the position that um, they consider this to be uh, uh, a disagreement or a problem between two states. It's actually a problem between four states because Maine, New Hampshire, as well as Massachusetts are having the same problem. Uh, their observer role has been to um, attend our meetings and to observe the dialogue, but uh, to date uh, not to actively participate in the problem. The, uh, we could file a formal complaint with FDA and then subsequently if it remains unresolved with the ISSC, the problem is that ISSC is a relatively new organization, meets once a year except for its midterm board meeting. The only unresolved issue that was resolved by the ISSC took over two years to resolve. And obviously we're hoping that uh, the cooperation between the states uh, will resolve the uh, problem in less time than that would take. The, um, uh, I mentioned the issue about the ISSC and states being in noncompliance uh, and mentioned that Massachusetts was one of the states that's in noncompliance with the ISSC. Uh, in 1987, new growing area harvest standards were put into effect and the state of Massachusetts, like uh, most of the other uh, 11 states is uh, in the process of achieving compliance with the ISSC standards. It's important to note that one of the concerns we have in Massachusetts um, is not whether or not states are in compliance and are making attempts to achieve that compliance, but when a state refuses to accept a standard, and this is our concern with the fecal coliform standard, even though we know it's not the best indicator, it's the only indicator that we have right now from a public health standpoint. Uh, we cannot throw out that indicator. We must use that indicator until such time as a better indicator comes along that better assesses the actual illness uh, potential of shellfish. Uh, in summary, uh, I have uh, put forth uh, a number of recommendations that deal with uh, improving communication and coordination, developing better surveillance programs, uh, making much more strategic use of scarce resources, and development of better indicator methods. The EPA, if there were a couple of things I could really stress, the EPA FDA policy document for chemical 
chemical contaminants uh, needs to be reviewed and decisions need to be made as to the best me method of assuring adherence to its content. It is an excellent document. And that document, along with a companion document for microbiological contamination, I think would do uh, a significant amount to resolving a lot of the coordination and communication problems. Regional confer conferences and work planning sessions between uh, state and federal agencies as well as the industry uh, I think uh, would maximize coordination and achieve better consistency of the assessment of risk, the management of programs, and the development of advisories and public education programs. Uh, better surveillance programs uh, will requi require greater commitments of personnel and funding. I think that uh, it is important to note, and I think you are going to get a lot more on this, but the HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point Approach, uh, no matter whether you are running a government program or government regulatory program or an industry program, uh, the use of critical control points to identify the highest priority aspects of your program, those aspects that most directly relate to uh, a public health uh, illness causing potential problem. Uh, that type of approach must be taken in all programs. I get a little concerned when I hear mandatory fish inspection because technically it is a potentially hazardous food and we have always uh, been mandated to in do inspections both at state and federal level of potentially hazardous foods. I think what we are talking more about is a prioritized comprehensive program that does a better job at looking at from a prioritized standpoint at where the critical control points are in the system. And yes, we do definitely agree that more standards and better standards are necessary. Uh, federal agencies, we feel, should work together to provide the leadership and coordination which states need to deal more effectively with the problems of contaminated fish and shellfish. Uh, and as a state um, uh, public health authority, uh, I can say without a doubt that if um, the issue is one as to uh, the appropriateness of agencies uh, for uh, being the le taking a lead uh, in public health protection for fish and shellfish, uh, it would be the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I think the emphasis is there and the support is there and the uh, premise is there for uh, the Food and Drug Administration to be in the best position to protect public health. If legislation is forthcoming, I think that legislation needs to be very specific as to whether or not we are going to balance risks and benefits or have a risk only or some combination uh, of, of risk and benefit uh, determinations in determining what is acceptable shellfish or what is safe fish and shellfish. With that, I know I have gone over, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, but I will end. Thank you. Ms. Ridley, the committee thanks you for your very helpful testimony. The chair also thanks you, Ms. Haas. The chair notes that you have made allusion to other matters in your statements, including the EPA FDA agreement. That will be without objection inserted at the appropriate place, as will the entirety of your statements. Ladies, uh, Ms. Montero, we thank you also for being present. We look forward to your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Suzanne Montero, and I am the special agent in charge of the Southeast Area Law Enforcement Office, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, National Marine Fisheries Service. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to discuss this tri-state sting operation that our office conducted in early 1988, which targeted shellfish dealers taking clams and oysters from closed and polluted areas in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. The illegal shellfish was being harvested in violation of state laws and subsequent, subsequently sold in interstate commerce which is a violation of the Lacey Act Amendments of 1981. The first operation began in 1987 in South Carolina when the State Wildlife and Marine Resources Division asked us to assign an undercover agent to work with two of their state officers in targeting dealers who were harvesting undersized and egg-bearing blue crabs, subsequently selling them in interstate commerce. By December of 1987, the investigation revealed that dealers were significantly involved in the interstate sale and shipment of clams from closed and polluted areas. In the spring of 1987, 
representatives from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and NOAA Fisheries met in Biloxi, Mississippi. The meeting was called by FDA to request assistance in enforcing the Lacey Act on Louisiana dealers who were harvesting and buying untagged oysters from closed and polluted areas and selling them in interstate commerce. The oysters were primarily being shipped to California and the northeastern United States. According to FDA officials at the meeting, violations were so rampant that they were considering closing down the oyster industry in Louisiana. Both agencies agreed to commit funds and several full-time investigators to start an undercover operation in January 1988. In February 1988, our office began a third undercover operation in East Point and Apalachicola, Florida, at the request of the Florida Department of Natural Resources, Florida Marine Patrol Division. The Florida Marine Patrol provided significant information on interstate trafficking of untagged or illegally harvested oysters from closed and polluted areas within the state of Florida. The state assigned an undercover investigator to work with our agent in conducting the investigations. The three undercover operations culminated on September 1, 1988, when 16 federal warrants and nine state warrants were served simultaneously in Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. The investigations took approximately one year. Undercover agents bought and sold approximately $6,000 worth of oysters and clams, while record seas showed an excess of $3 million in interstate transactions by the 16 dealers. During the investigations, undercover agents sold untagged clams and oysters to dealers and bought clams and oysters in interstate commerce. In approximately 95% of the cases, our undercover agents assisted the dealers in tagging the sacks with fictitious tags on the shellfish so that the shellfish would have appear to have come from open areas. National Marine Fishery Service and FDA have a memorandum of understanding on shellfish and National Marine Fishery Service has cooperative enforcement agreements with coastal state areas for enforcement assistance. One of the most significant reasons the investigations were successful was the contribution of labor-intensive effort by state and federal agencies. No one state or federal enforcement agency has the manpower, funds, or jurisdictional authorities to single-handedly enforce federal and state laws against the illegal harvest, transport, export, import, sale, and purchase of, illeg of illegal molluscan shellfish. Instead, resources are pooled, intelligence shared, and unique jurisdictional boundaries inherent with each agency are applied. For instance, NOAA Fisheries has criminal investigators with historical experience in undercover investigations and statutory authority to enforce the Lacey Act. FDA has inspection authority under the U.S. Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and investigators who are knowledgeable of individual shellfish processing plants. The states have law enforcement officers and investigators who have state police powers and local knowledge of shellfish harvester and dealer activities. Separate state charges are usually discovered in our Lacey Act operations. For example, in the South Carolina operation on clam, 1,800 individual state charges were filed in addition to the 19 federal charges. The story will not have a happy ending, however, as long as illegal harvesting and interstate sh sales of shellfish from closed and polluted areas continue to be widespread. Manpower and funding is being stretched to the limit while a growing backlog of cases awaiting investigative action has occurred. States are constantly requesting our investigative officers to assist as state judges are too lenient and fines are too low. The Lacey Act is a very beneficial law in enforcing illegal shellfish entering interstate commerce. 
but federal prosecutions do not always deter illegal activities either. In some of our cases, federal attorneys have plea bargained felony charges down to misdemeanors. This is particularly significant if a state has regulatory authority to revoke a state dealer's license based upon a felony charge. Legal interpretations of Section 3373 in the Lacey Act, which limits federal felony criminal penalties to sales and purchases with a market value in excess of $350, has become a problem when undercover buys and sales must occur in small quantities to preserve funding. The parallel example that I can offer you is an attorney's perception of the importance of a case from an agency. For example, if a DEA agent walked into a U.S. attorney's office with a case involving one ounce of cocaine versus one kilo of cocaine, the U.S. attorney would put that case at the top of the list as considering it more important. In conclusion, shellfish is being illegally harvested from closed and polluted areas on a regular basis. The states generally have some form of shellfish laws, but fines are minimal and standardization is weak. State tagging laws must be made more uniform with an accountability system developed. Cooperative state-federal investigations under the Lacey Act can have a significant impact on the shellfish black market, but federal judges and U.S. attorneys need to be more aware of the seriousness of the existing problems and dangers that face every shellfish consumer so that more severe uniform penalties will be imposed to deter illegal activities. Thank you. Ladies of the panel, the committee thanks you for your very kind assistance. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ms. Montero, let me start uh, with you. I, I think you have made it very clear that the system for dealing with uh, the illegal harvesting uh, issue uh, is just riddled with holes. And I'd like to go through some of those uh, specifically with you. My understanding is that you can make huge profits with re in uh, illegal harvesting, and I've been told that you can make thousands of dollars, for example, in just one evening if you're an illegal harvester. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, it's also my understanding that the occurrence of closed area night harvesting is shooting up rapidly that it has escalated dramatically recently. Is that correct? That's my understanding. And areas close and open um, periodically throughout the year. Is that due to the higher oyster shell stock market prices? Is that one of the uh, factors? I don't believe I can answer that affirmatively. Um, my understanding is that in some cases it's due to the testing of the water. Uh, it also seems to me, based on your testimony and what we've been told, that the prospect of getting caught in this area is very, very small. You're correct there. The, the hardest, the reason that we targeted dealers, quite frankly, is that, number one, it has an impact of significance when if we can get dealers' licenses pulled, they're no longer in business. It is much easier to do an undercover operation through dealers than it is to go out and try to make a case on harvesters where you actually have to set up surveillances on where the harvesters are taking the shellfish, where they are going, and then you lose track of them once they go into the dealer. You don't know if these are closed. You know, you can tell if they're closed areas. You don't know if they're tagged, if they're not. So it takes a lot more manpower and a lot more funding to run this kind of operation than it does an undercover operation on the dealers. And my sense is also that this is pretty good geography for the criminal element to hang out in. You're talking about expensive patrolling uh, situations, uh, expansive uh, coastlines. There are basically a lot of places for criminals to hide when they're involved in this area. Is that correct? 
the people can bring mm -hmm. in the product almost to any dock anywhere and then it can be trucked to the dealer so it's it it is very widespread as far as where these products can be brought into in remote areas is there a lot of bootlegging going on in this area as well I what do you mean by bootlegging in particular as far as I don't quite understand well let's let's maybe back back it up who's typically prosecuted in the illegal seafood harvesting cases our cases have typically involved the dealers although when the state makes cases sometimes they're able to go back to the harvesters based on records that are seized now who is not apprehended or prosecuted in uh, these cases generally are retailers retailers are not and why is why is that pretty much because it, it's too hard to determine where the product goes to the individual retailers once it leaves we're talking about products for instance in Louisiana where truck tractor truckloads of oysters are picked up and shipped out of state and distributed everywhere in the small instance where you do uh, bring someone to trial and someone is convicted what kind of punishments are likely to be uh, meted out? Our experience so far has been probations. Um, in some cases, probation that requires the person to not be able to uh, deal in this product for, say, three to six months. Um, we have not had significant fines. Um, we've certainly had no jail time. And it is, I gather, fairly hard to get the judicial system interested in going after these cases. It's hard to get them interested. Um, primarily, it's, it's not hard as far as convincing them that it is a health problem. The biggest problem in my opinion that we have is that our buys are so very small for instance we buy and sell maybe 20 back 20 sacks um, because we have to spread our undercover funds out so that we can cover a lot of a lot of activities you never make one buy and sale on a dealer um, particularly because that might be a one-time occurrence so you have to make more than one so because of the small quantities that we're dealing in, um, I believe that the U.S. attorneys feel that if it were that important, then why are not we dealing in much higher monetary purchases and, and sales? Now, it's my understanding that if someone, uh, say a wholesaler, has been involved in uh, illegal uh, harvesting, very often they can still market their seafood even after a conviction because the federal government can't be in the position of revoking a state fishing license. Is that correct? That's correct. In my statement, the reason I mentioned that we were very interested in getting felony convictions is that in most of the states that we have dealt with, there are state laws that say based upon a felony charge or conviction, whatever the case may be, they can pull their dealer's license completely. But when we get misdemeanor convictions, that law does not apply. Let me ask you also uh, at this time with uh, respect to the issue of tagging as well. I, I think you've touched on that. Uh, with the staff. The current system of identifying legally harvested shellfish with tags contains information about where it was harvested and it's supposed to assure purchasers that the seafood has come from safe waters. Have you found in your inquiry that there are shortcomings to this uh, particular system? There's several sh shortcomings in, in our experience. One, the tags are not standardized throughout the states. Different tags. Um, we have not seen 
an accountability system um, on those tags. I mentioned that our undercover agents helped the dealers tag the untagged sack of oysters that we were selling them. So they have handfuls of tags and you walk in there, you're making a buy your, your, or sale, you've got untagged oysters and they say, come on, let's put the tags on here. And they put the area in which they want to put on there, which is always going to be a clean area so that when it goes through the system, it's, it appears legal. And you would generally say that this is an area that can be easily abused at, at, uh, at this Quite point. Quite easily. And the states have, uh, have different uh, uh, systems. I'm, I'm particularly interested in this point because as I, I looked at the overall uh, seafood inspection uh, system in this country, you know, I just found it fragmented and uncoordinated. And it seems that in this tagging area, for example, you just don't have one consistent uh, type of, uh, of system and it can be easily abused. Is that correct? That is one of the areas that we have a, a patrol committee, law enforcement committee at the um, ISSC meetings and we have chiefs of state organizations that are working together on that committee. That is one of the recommendations that we've been strongly pushing as far as standardized state tags. Well, you, you have been very helpful. M Mr. Chairman, with, with your permission, I just want to ask Ms. Haas uh, one question, if, if I might. I, I know my, my time has, uh, has expired. Ms. Haas, uh, the FDA pointed out to the subcommittee that there are, in their view, only a few chemicals that can directly uh, affect fish. In your opinion, is that an accurate statement? No, that's not an accurate statement at, at all. In, f in fact, um, I don't know how you define a few, but to begin with, they have 13 action levels that can be found in fish. Um, and those really are more significant and should have tolerances, not just an informal action. Um, things like, and not only PCBs, but DDT, dioxin, um, chlordane, all of those are very significant threats to consumer health and really very little is being done to monitor for them. I think it's the combination not only um, of the lack of tolerances but also how little the monitoring that FDA undertakes. Has there been any uh, recent study to your knowledge uh, to examine the effect of combinations of chemicals on fish and, uh, and seafood? One of the problems with seafood and the whole problem of seafood safety is the paucity of data that we have. Because there's not been an inspection program like we have meat and poultry inspection, there's not been that kind of research to see the synergistic effects. We've had a great deal of attention about the effects of pesticide residues on fruits and vegetables and the consumption that children face. And I think the United States has faced a real crisis in confidence because of that. The fish situation when it comes to illegal pesticide residues is even more serious because there's a higher level of illegal residues and there's virtually little, if any, research to um, demonstrate all of this. Mr. Chairman, I know my, my time's expired, but one area that I think would be very appropriate uh, for uh, uh, the committee's follow-up is to uh, see if uh, an analysis could be done as to the number of, uh, of chemicals that could potentially uh, affect fish. It would seem to me that there are a number of uh, expert agencies that the chair has, uh, has worked with uh, in the past. And given what uh, uh, Ms. Haas uh, reports, and that was my understanding, there has been very little uh, research done uh, to examine the, the question of uh, the number of chemicals and, and which ones in, in particular could uh, potentially affect fish. And uh, uh, having worked with you often on these kinds of matters, that would be one area I, I think would be very appropriate uh, for further follow-up. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Chair, I'll see that that's done. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Um, chair wants to... Oh, the chair has some questions, Ms. Haas, for you. Um, by the way, I'd like to welcome you to the committee. Thank you very much. Uh, in past discussions, you have estimated th that an inspection program would cost around $75 million. Is it your view that this is still a reasonable cost estimate? Considering um, increasing costs, I would still say that it would be, 
be under $100 million, somewhere between $75 and $100 million. It's important to note, and I'd like to go back to Ms. Ridley's comment, we never talked about a continuous inspection program. We are talking about a prioritized program based on HACCP. And given the number of inspectors that would be required for that, I think $75 to $100 million is the estimate at this time as well. Ms. Ridley, you were nodding affirmatively. Yes, no. In terms of, um, uh, we have tried to estimate what it would take uh, at the state level if a more comprehensive program was put into place. Um, and the estimates are that it would take uh, probably about two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars in a state the size of Massachusetts um, to do a, a more comprehensive job added to what we're doing right now. So I, I can see if there was a national program, because a lot of the cost of the program is going to be research and identifying and setting standards and tolerances that do not currently exist. And that is a very expensive proposition. Could you, could you perhaps assist the committee by giving us an indication about what would be the uh, basis for this estimate? In other words, what, what services, what activities, <coughs> what personnel, what uh, matters would the inspection program go into? In terms of Massachusetts, we had a bill filed to do something similar in Massachusetts this year. Um, the types of, right now in Massachusetts, um, we get to certain uh, high priority establishments such as those that process shellfish, uh, anywhere from four to six times per year. Uh, lower priority uh, establishments that are processing fish it could be once every three years. We estimate that we need to at least double, uh, if not triple, the number of inspections that we're performing. We have three major uh, ports in, in Massachusetts, the Gloucester, uh, the Boston, and the New Bedford uh, fish piers. We right now are making spot checks at these fish piers no more than once a week. Uh, really, we should have a, a much more intensive. Now, this is just physical surveillance program. In terms of our harvest areas, uh, we have resourced, uh, we have about um, uh, one half, no, about a uh, little over half of the resources that we need to do a good job at uh, sanitary surveys, at classifying our growing areas. So basically, we need, um, we, we have a very good handle at the state level. Uh, both, it doesn't matter whether you're in an environmental agency or a public health agency, as to what the resources are that would be necessary from both a fish um, and a shellfish standpoint to do a more comprehensive, prioritized inspection. In fact, I'd be surprised if other states, other than Massachusetts, didn't have, hadn't had bills filed similar to what's being proposed at the federal level, so they haven't, they basically have had to estimate what the, that cost would be on a state-to-state -state basis. Mr. Chairman, it's important to note also that we spend $400 million annually for our meat and poultry inspection program. And the findings that you have up here on your charts demonstrate that the problems are even more serious um, in the areas of seafood safety. And we're really recommending a program that would be one quarter of the, the price tag that exists for meat and poultry. Um, and as I mentioned before, you're 10 times more likely to have a foodborne illness outbreak from fish than you are from either beef or poultry, even though we eat so much more. Most of the cost, too, would come from increasing the inspectors. Um, presently, we don't even certify the fishing vessels. Even though those fishing vessels may not have icing facilities, those fishing vessels may be open to the sun, those fishing vessels may be scattered with pigeon excrement. And yet we don't have inspectors that go on those fishing vessels and check them spot checks once a year. We don't even have the kind of inspectors that go into the plants even once a year. So we need to set up that kind of national program, and I think that's really a, a very cost-effective price because we're trading off long-term health costs for consumers for that $75 million. Now, in the case of the Department of Agriculture with regard to meat and poultry, that's financed directly out of the federal yes. treasury. Would be, it would not be necessary to set up exactly the same kind of program or program finance the same way to provide protection with regard to fish and shellfish, would it? I do believe that it, it is essential that any kind of program that is a public health program be financed by the taxpayer 
from the Federal Treasury, as we do with all public health programs, and not from the corporate users. It's very hard to have the objectivity um, of an inspector in a plant when he's being paid by that same plant management. And so it's essential that, that the system be parallel to USDA, but it's also parallel to all of FDA's public health food inspection programs. We really can't have a user fee based program for public health. Of course, the chair is vastly frustrated by the fact that we have food and drug and other agencies of that sort which are incapable of carrying out their responsibilities because of lack of budget, lack of personnel. The end result is that the work that needs to be done to address these problems isn't done because we don't have any money, we don't have any personnel. FDA got a million dollars this year, no new people. None to relate to the problem that we're discussing. The uh, concern I have is not that we give the manufacturer, or the processor, or the producer control over the, over the program, but simply that we, we begin to generate some revenues that can be directed at, at providing the kind of health inspections and other public health services that are required in connection with the catching and the, man and the processing of this kind of food. Do you still have the same objections, Ms. Haas, if, if I indicate to you that, that it's my personal thing, no way we're going to get money out of general revenue of the Treasury for this purpose, and if we don't, if we don't lay assessments against the persons who would, who would, who would produce these, <coughs> these foods, that we may never get the inspection that we require in a time of growing pressures, both budgetary and in terms of health and contamination of the environment. Mr. Chairman, I do share your concern about the limited and strained resources of the Food and Drug Administration. And I think, therefore, we have to really question whether all of the responsibility for fish inspection should appropriately then go to the Food and Drug Administration, who will always be strapped for, for finances. Um, and do we have to look at possibly some of the responsibilities going to other agencies where they have larger resources, such as the Department of Agriculture? Well, the Department of Agriculture is well known for the failures of its, in its poultry inspection. It's, it's uh, well respected for the amount of uh, bone and so forth that it permits in hot dogs and things of that kind. And I'm curious if, if, if you regard that as the exemplar of a, of a good program that we should have in food and drug. I, I um, agree with you about the inadequacies at the Department of Agriculture. In fact, we petitioned the department not to allow bone in hot dogs, wound up bone in hot dogs, though they proceeded to do it. Anyhow, um, however, the Meat and Poultry Inspection Acts are very strong statutes and have been in administered in a, in a very tight fashion, except for some of these pr recent problems. Um, I think it's a very complex issue and one we have to look at um, very carefully. And I, I don't think that quickly moving to a user fee based program is, is the way to go because of it really compromising the objectivity of that inspection program. I guess you get right down to the question, would you rather have a user fee based program or no program? Because I don't see any program coming. Food and Drug has had this for years. It's been one of the things I've intended to get on. I was uh, just reminded by uh, Dr. Russell here that I'd introduced legislation back in 1974 to deal with this, but I got busy with other things and moved, from, moved away from the committee where that legislation was to be dealt with. Uh, nothing has been done in the interim period. A lot of people have gotten sick, and I gather a few have died. And if we had uh, done it back in 74, it would have cost much less than it would cost well, today. <laughs> and, and, and we would have an industry that was accustomed to the sensible disciplines of a good inspection program. And I, I just am curious how we're going to get something going here for this country if we don't do something, if, if we don't get a program going which can be funded in, through some available revenue source. I don't propose to say, industry, you go out and set the program up when we will, we will provide you the statutory authority. I propose to see to it that we set up a, a, an inspection program and then we assess the industry for the cost of it. To me, that makes excellent good sense. It gets two things done. One, it gets the federal program in place, and two, it gets the funding that needs to be put in place to accomplish your purpose. This would be breaking precedent for our other inspection programs, right. which are based on public health, do not assess the industry and have maintained really the objectivity. And not just the ones that are housed at the Department of Agriculture, but this is, to my knowledge, would be the first time an inspection program at the FDA would be conducted. Um, 
with the industry chipping in. Well, you, if we... Well, the industry's money spends about as good as anybody else's. And, it, and it's fine money. And, and, my old friend, <laughs> and my old friend Manny Seller used to remind me on a fairly continuous basis that consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds. Well, chair, the chair notes that the, that the time the chair has, uh, has expired. Uh, Mr. Wyden. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Ridley, uh, you talked about both uh, microbiological contamination mm -hmm. and chemical contamination. Right. And let me see if I might ask you a couple of questions uh, about both. You mentioned that microbiological indicator standards in some cases underestimate the pathogenic potential and in some cases overestimate the hazard potential of shellfish. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that we really don't have a very good system today for indicating shellfish safety? Uh, that's correct. Uh, the standard that we have, it's true, has managed for many, many, many years, this is the 230 fecal coliform standard, uh, to prevent many uh, illnesses. However, uh, if we look at the incidences and the data that we've been looking at, um, obviously it falls short because uh, the incidences that are related to shellfish amongst this are quite high. There are newer pathogens, uh, environmental pathogens such as the Vibrio vulnificus that are gaining in their, uh, the numbers that are being reported each year. There are viruses um, that are not always associated with uh, sewage contamination. Therefore, we do know that the indicator system that we have um, does represent an underestimate in some cases um, of that potential. Well, I, I want you to know that this is one area that I'm, I'm really going to follow up on in, in working uh, with Chairman Dingle because I think that uh, your last answer is particularly help, helpful for the record that they're really are some significant gaps in the standards as it relates to shellfish uh, safety and how it's determined. That's very helpful to have on the record. You mentioned uh, the traceability issue also before. Yeah. Um, you may be interested to know that uh, the state of Massachusetts and the state of New York received a contract from the Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration a couple of years ago to establish a cradle-to-grave type of traceability system. Uh, in Massachusetts, we have such a system in place. However, when you're one state surrounded by 48 or 49 without a system, it makes it very difficult uh, to implement. We'd be happy to share with you the results um, of the survey that we did. And we actually have tamper evidence seals on our shell stock uh, that are required within the state of Massachusetts, in addition to uh, multiple copy uh, transaction forms that accompany shellfish. Now, it's been the FDA's position, uh, Ms. Ridley, that the bacteriological criteria should be considered only as an indicator of the quality of the product and not intended to be used solely to judge whether uncooked shellfish meats are safe. Does this mean then that the standard doesn't have to be used as a mandatory guideline? Uh, I believe that uh, FDA uses it for to assess the um, acceptability of their imports that they receive. At the state level, uh, many states, like the state of Massachusetts, it's incorporated as an actual regulation. However, uh, the Interstate Shellfish Sanitation Conference, the ISSC uh, Manual of Operations, has it as a guideline. Uh, it recommends that it be used as the arbiter for accepting shipments. Um, it sets out a, f a flow chart of uh, if, you know, what you do when you have a first violation, a second violation, a third violation, in terms of using to, to progressively exclude, um, after a number of violations, shipment from that particular dealer. So you would say then that uh, the bacteriological uh, criteria would only be an indicator of quality and not a guarantee of safety. Oh no, it's an, in, it's an indicator system only. Well, how then can one determine safety as well as the quality of the product? Right now, we're on a system where we try to um, assess the potential for the harvest area as well as the product for causing illness. Um, to perform specific bacteriological tests for all known pathogens, salmonella, uh, staph, hepatitis, 
uh, would not only be costly, but in some cases impossible, if, because for some there is not a routinely available uh, method for doing the testing. So proving absolute safety uh, is not uh, something that's practical today. Indicator systems, but better indicator systems, will, uh, are what we need to assess the potential for human illness. Now the FDA goes on to point out that the use of guidelines for other species or oysters or product forms for hard or soft clams and for mussels is inappropriate and doesn't have scientific validity. Given their view, what tools does a state uh, health department person have to make a calculation if a product is unsafe? Uh, the standard has been recommended for use in all three. Uh, in the manual of operations. Uh, it is true that the original indicator standard was developed uh, for oysters. It has since been applied uh, as the only standard that currently exists to cover all three uh, species. But this is a voluntary standard, as I understand. Well, not for many, most states. Uh, there are many states like Massachusetts that have it by regulation, not just as a guideline. But, but at the national level, uh, the National Shellfish Sanitation Program is a voluntary... It's uh, a voluntary organization. If one state chooses to disagree with another state's criteria for acceptable bacterial limits, what recourse uh, do states have to protect uh, public health? Right now, um, you can do, as we did in the state of Massachusetts, uh, issue embargoes against individual firms if it does not comply with your state standards. Um, I feel strongly that even though it's uh, a guideline in the manual, uh, I think a state could still, as Massachusetts could, could file a complaint with FDA and with the ISSC. Um, I, we, you can deal with it as we have by individual uh, uh, firm embargoes. Now you mentioned in your statement that the Maryland growing areas appear to be properly classified, but that a number of environmental and post-harvesting handling practices may possibly have resulted in a proliferation of bacteria. Could you uh, describe for the subcommittee what you consider to be some of those improper handling practices uh, which took place and could have contributed to elevated bacterial counts? The harvesting in Chesapeake Bay occurs uh, out on the water uh, by means of um, uh, dredges uh, that dredge up the shellfish. Uh, none of the vessels, uh, the boats, until uh, really late last year had any even rudimentary forms of refrigeration. Uh, vessels would stay out on the, on, on the bay for uh, many hours, uh, sometimes as long as uh, most of the day, in the hot sun with the shellfish unprotected and exposed to the high uh, air temperatures. Uh, coupled with the fact that they're coming out of relatively warm water, uh, which often runs in excess of 80 degrees uh, by the end of the summer, uh, this was sufficient to cause stress to the shellfish. In addition to the, that type of non-refrigeration practice, um, there were uh, a number of the handling facilities on shore, uh, and we visited probably about six to ten of them when we were there last August, which did not have the capabilities uh, to properly refrigerate or handle the volume of shellfish that they were handling. There were uh, a number of practices occurring, like when we started last summer, there were only 16 dealers sending shellfish to Massachusetts from Maryland, yet by the end of the summer we had embargoed 19 dealers and there were still some in operation. What was happening was that as a, a firm became embargoed, it would reincorporate um, under uh, a wife's, a relative, someone else's name uh, at the same location, and this was something that was acceptable to the state of Maryland, so that often you were getting the same shellfish, but just from a different incorporated entity. Uh, and I think that's you know, one of the reasons why we uh, had such problems trying to reduce the percentage of violation. So what what you're saying is as recently as last year, mm -hmm. uh, here in the Maryland area, you had a significant failure to adhere to basic kind of health and safety uh, procedures, such as uh, uh, keeping refrigeration uh, systems on board for, for 
fish that, uh, that has been, been harvested. And even after you took action, given that these improper handling procedures were used, you found uh, that the system could still be manipulated where people would just reincorporate or come in under uh, another name. Right, and we've done two things since then. First, we passed a regulation uh, last November that will allow us, uh, if necessary, to um, uh, shut off an entire state from shipping into Massachusetts if the violations are continuous um, and unrelenting. The second thing uh, that happened is that the State of Maryland Health Department has been extremely um, uh, attentive to the problem. Uh, obviously, there's uh, something which may happen as a result of this. They've been extremely attentive. And as of last Thursday, June 1st, uh, new regulations were put into effect in the, state of uh, in the State of Maryland, which affect the refrigeration issue. Uh, on the boats, and it sets a much tighter system um, in terms of, you were talking about landings, uh, or someone was talking about landings earlier, uh, boats can now only come in to landing sites that are staffed by a state, um, uh, either health department or environmental department employee. Uh, special tags, new tagging is, is being put onto these uh, uh, shellfish, which is going to be very tightly controlled, uh, only available from uh, the state points of, of sale. Maryland has, uh, it appears, taken many steps to try to correct this problem. It's hoped that we will not have this problem this year. My, my sense is, based on what you've said and what I know, that the FDA should have taken a more aggressive role in dealing with this particular situation. What's your sense? I think that uh, I would have hoped that they had. Um, I would have, uh, I have to give credit to uh, their laboratory facility in Davisville, Rhode Island uh, did some sample analyses for us when we were trying to determine specific pathogens that, that were present uh, in the Maryland shellfish. I think that because of the known problems with the indicator system, underestimates in many cases, uh, in some cases, yes, there may be overestimates of public health harm, um, FDA chose at this point to allow the states to try to work out their differences uh, and their problems amongst themselves. Uh, I think that, um, in a way, being a states' rights person, um, I, I kind of like to see the states, I, I wish we could work them out. I hope that we don't have to go much longer. I, I, I know my, my, my time has expired, and I, I want to identify with that last point that, that you're talking about, is that uh, any sensible reconfiguration or new legislation has got to have the states playing a significant role in all this. But as I look at these particular kinds of cases, you've got to have an activist federal government with a responsible, coordinated role focusing on real priorities, as you've mentioned and Ms. Haas. And I look even at this situation now, you can't even really use the interstate shellfish conference, as I understand it, unless the FDA directs them. So you said, in response to my question, you had hoped that the FDA would play a more active role. If they don't, you don't then get the shellfish conference involved, do you? The key term is leadership, and that's what's, that's what, what, that's what's needed, and it's what's been missing. Mm -hmm. I, Mr. Wyden, if I can just comment. Consumers um, all over the country deserve the same kind of protection. The consumers in Massachusetts are probably um, in a lucky position. One, they have a very aggressive public health mission up there. And secondly, there's a competitive reason to make sure that they keep out Maryland um, shellfish. But when you go to Indiana or you go to Michigan or you go to states in Arizona, those oysters are shipped there. Those states may not be doing the same kind of aggressive work that they're doing in Massachusetts for those reasons. And the consumers there are not getting the same kind of protection. So what we need is to protect equally the consumers all over the country with the kind of national standards that the FDA has to follow. Um, with the voluntary program, they've never even withdrawn um, the program um, from any one state, and it just demonstrates how really impotent the program has been. I think my, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. Um, Ms. Montero, years ago, when I was chairman of the Little Subcommittee on Fisheries and Wildlife Conservation, we found we had a big problem with illegal taking of 
migratory waterfowl for purposes of selling in interstate commerce. And the law was very weak, and there wasn't much in the way of penalties, there weren't much resources, the fines were not very high, there wasn't much in the way of jail terms. We didn't observe that much was happening in terms of enforcement authority, there wasn't much money, and there was no authority to seize the assets of persons engaged in that kind of activity. So we took a hard look at it, and all of a sudden we found that all these things weren't being done. So we put together a piece of legislation on this particular point, and the House passed it, the Senate passed it, went down to the President. All of a sudden we found that the report which we had filed had strong sections in it denouncing indifference on the part of prosecutors and courts with regard to penalties of this sort. The jailhouses began to fill up, property was seized, uh, big fines, big penalties were laid in place, and all of a sudden the uh, mischief stopped. I wonder if something of that kind wouldn't be useful here. I think we, I think we definitely um, need. Well, we found, we found, we had, we found the law wasn't being enforced. There wasn't much statutory authority. There weren't big penalties. There wasn't any seizure of property. Nobody was going to jail. The U.S. attorney sort of laughed at the whole business. Judges didn't think it was very important, and uh, we changed it all. And all of a sudden, that sort of misbehavior came to halt. And I wonder if we did well, that I, here. That wouldn't stop. We, we wouldn't find the same beneficent result. I. The reason I said that I thought the Act was an effective tool against the interstate commerce of shellfish is because I think there are penalties there. Um, I think that if it seemed important enough to the judges and the U.S. Attorney that if used properly, it would be a good mechanism. And normally we find that if, in fact, we do pull a dealer's license or take a vessel off the water or seize their uh, conveyance or put somebody in jail, it doesn't take very long in that particular area for that to be a precedence and things die down for a while and start becoming legal. So I agree with you that um, I think the key to the enforcement of this whole thing is the penalty process, the removal of licenses, and the probably seizure of some of these trucks that are hauling loads of illegal shellfish. I think, I think that that will help a great deal to stop. And jail the driver. Well, uh, Ms. Ridley, what is the potential negative effect of the alleged dispute between EPA and FDA arising from the Quincy Bay study? I think a mixed message to both uh, to the consumers and the public is a, a key effect that's occurred uh, so far, as well as uh, a lot of hard work being put in on studies by both state, local, and federal agencies, and then seeing um, a, another federal report come out that basically uh, says that report was wrong. And I think it, it leaves consumers and the agencies themselves in a position of, of coming out with a very mixed message as to whether or not there are health risks associated with our contaminated seafood. And I think that message um, needs to be consistent and clear, and we need to come to some kind of agreement um, as to the risks. Now, you made mention, Ms. Ridley, that few tolerances and action levels exist with regard to chemical contaminants. There right. are only a relatively small number of them have been identified. Right. Mr. Wyden, I think, has very astutely observed we have a problem here mm -hmm. and that we don't have a real good index of what these con chemical contaminants might be. Uh, I gather that states have been affected by this. They've gotten little guidance and have been compelled in cases of some states to develop action programs of their own with regard to these matters, mm -hmm. giving us a, a kind of a spotty pattern of action in terms of federal and state and different kinds of state action. Is that correct? Yes, it is. In some cases, it is due to the fact that uh, local consumption patterns do differ. Uh, if you're uh, in an area like a coastal area 
we have access to both recreationally, um, or from a recreational standpoint, large amounts of, of fish uh, and shellfish, then your consumption patterns tend to be much higher than they are for the rest of the country. Uh, and therefore, some states, uh, coastal states in addition to the Great Lakes states, um, have done a lot of work um, in the development of uh, either action levels or uh, advisories, at a minimum, health advisories. Now, you mentioned that some states do not use FDA action levels, Minnesota being one. Mm -hmm. Rather than use FDA risk assessments, they've adopted their own. You've indicated then that this creates a sort of a spotty situation, especially, uh, and, and some peculiarities, for example, if two states border the same body of water, you will have mm -hmm. fish meeting two standards. It's also interesting to note that if there's no FDA enforcement, uh, fish can move back and forth across the border, and even though one state might have a strong plan for protecting its citizens from contaminated fish or shellfish, its sister state might in turn ship into the state with higher standards, you wind up with uh, chancy protection at best. It's my understanding this, uh, that the eight states in, the, uh, in Ontario have attempted to, uh, to try to uh, for, uh, sign an MOU, I believe it is, uh, that would uh, develop uniform and consistent advisories for all of the states in the Great Lakes area. That's exactly the type of, of uh, coordinated communication that both EPA and FDA in the states need to do as a, as a triad um, in order to develop those types of, of um, consistencies. Being again a states' rights person, um, there are individual consumption patterns, particularly with ethnic populations, which um, may end up saying that what's good in Minnesota is not the same that might be good in Illinois. I mean, there, there are differences um, that have to be recognized. Uh, that's why states have to be able to develop their own uh, advisories. Now, there, there are um, a number of different potential contaminants. I gather there's a possibility of cumulative risk from multiple contaminants, for oh. example, back, uh, bacteria uh, and possibly different <laughs> kinds of, of uh, contaminants. For example, PCBs, mm -hmm. DDT, acute and or, chronic, or heavy metals, or something mm -hmm. that kind. Perhaps all of the above. Is mm -hmm. that right? Oh, uh, acute and chronic risks are possible from uh, any product. Uh, some of the ones that we have, we we know of a lot of histopathologic uh, abnormalities, tumors on fish, that we're not sure of what the causes are. There are things that are present for which we don't have. Uh, tolerances at present, things like the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the PAHs a lot of people talk about, which we are desperately looking for methods as well as uh, standards. Uh, it may be that some of these contaminants are what's actually causing the histopathologic um, uh, abnormalities on the internal organs as well as the gills uh, um, and the flesh of fish. I got the problem of subsistence fishermen around the uh, country. Great Lakes, uh, Quincy Bay, but in addition to the subsistence fishermen, mm -hmm. you've also got your sports fisher mm -hmm. who eat a significant amount of fish. I detect that uh, the risk assessment uh, does not deal with this fully, and it does not deal with the, the particular types or times of harvesting or the or the areas or the amount of fish that might be consumed by an individual. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's well documented in the joint EPA FDA policy as well. Now, you mentioned the tagging Traceability. situation. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the, the possibilities for abuse in mm -hmm. connection with tagging. Uh, is there a better alternative than, than, than tagging? Uh, or can tagging be helped in terms of its defects by seeing to it that uh, Perhaps the false tagging of shipments makes them subject to seizure, or perhaps uh, makes the possibility of the good citizen that did that subject to uh, a time and appropriate federal institution. I think there has to be a uniform, much more comprehensive system for tagging. And I also strongly advise what we've gone to in Massachusetts, which is tamper evident seals, uh, seals that uh, are serialized and which uh, can be used to seal the bags uh, of, of shell stock. This but is a can't system. Be tampered with. Excuse, they, they can't, it, it's evident if they're tampered with. Uh, these types of systems would have to be implemented across the board. 
Uh, really, you need a cradle-to-grave system um, that tracks shellfish from the time of harvest, from the harvester right through the retail setting. That has to be implemented nationwide. So you're, you're, you're urging a tagging system which would be consistent for all states? Yes. You're urging that it would be that the tags would be controlled, uh, that there be certain uh, qualifications with regard to use of tagging, that the tags have to be essentially tamper-proof. Tamper evident. And mm -hmm. you're, you're urging, I suspect, a federal state cooperative program to address this problem, are you not? That's correct. We did this as part of the, the contract we did for the Food and Drug Administration uh, three years ago, and we recommended it both to ISSC as well as to the federal government in our final report that this type of system be implemented nationwide. What did FDA do about that? Uh, we presented it to the ISSC, and there's been no uh, action taken on it at this point. So they received it graciously and did nothing with it? They paid for the contract. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to ask uh, one question, in fact, uh, particularly Ms. Ridley and, and Ms. Haas, but uh, Ms. Montero, uh, perhaps your input would be helpful as well. Do you all think it would be useful for the federal government at this point to develop a consistent reporting system among all the states so that all relevant diseases would be reported? Yes, that is one of our recommendations, as is the traceback system. Um, Part of the problem that we suffer from is the lack of information. And only if we increase the kind of reporting would we know how to follow up in prevention and the kind of tests that are needed. And I think that it's a very important part of any kind of inspection program. Um, I, I thoroughly agree. My state epidemiologist would say that there is one through CDC. However, as we know, uh, the uh, numbers, the, the actual getting out there and beating the bushes is what it takes to actually get the reports in. In Massachusetts, foodborne illness is mandatorily reportable. Unfortunately, many people don't report to either a physician or a hospital. Therefore, the, 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 the laws are out there not on the individual. An educational um, uh, program needs to be undertaken with the consumer to get them to report foodborne illness. I agree as well. I think that's one of the main things that we need. I see a lot of reports that have different kinds of figures on them for various, the same year even, and um, that combined with, with the standardized tagging system mm -hmm. um, will be very beneficial in determining how widespread the problem is in the future. Well, one of the reasons, frankly, I, I find that appealing, Ms. Ridley, is that's, that's one way to move towards a state's rights kind of approach, the kind of approach that you're, you're talking about where the states play a leadership uh, role but where the federal government has, has taken an activist position and come up with some consistent guidelines so that we do get all relevant uh, diseases reported. And I want to commend all our witnesses. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, thanks, gentlemen. Uh, Ms. Montero, we thank you for your assistance to the committee. We're very, we very grateful to you for your very kind and able assistance to us. Chair announces that our next Panel. Our next <laughs> panel is uh, is uh, composed of one member, Mr. James Brennan. Mr. Brennan, would you come forward, please? Brennan, we, we thank you for being with us this morning. You've heard the rituals that this committee has with regard to the beginning of the testimony of its, of its panel members. First, the chair advises that uh, you are entitled to the advice of counsel if you so wish. Do you, do you wish to be advised by counsel as you testify? Uh, I have no need for that, Mr. Chairman, but if, in fact, a well. question arises uh, regarding the interpretation, I Very well. Do you have any objection to testifying under oath? No, sir, I don't. That is the regular practice of this committee. Do you, do you uh, for your uh, information, copies of the rules the sub, of the subcommittee, the full committee, and the House are there to advise you of limitations on the power of the subcommittee and, of course, to inform you of your rights as you appear here before us. If you have no objection to appearing under oath, if you please rise your right, raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide. Mr. Brennan, you may consider yourself under oath. 
and you are recognized for your statement. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, my name is James Brennan. I serve as the Assistant Administrator for Fisheries of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the United States Department of Commerce. The wise and safe use of our nation's fishery resources is an important focus of NOAA. I am re responsible for NOAA's fishery-related programs, including resource management and utilization habitat conservation, and marine mammals and endangered species protection, as well as NOAA's voluntary seafood inspection program. I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss product safety, wholesomeness, and economic fraud issues with respect to seafood. The harvesting and production of aquatic species as a source of protein for human consumption is reaching worldwide high point levels. While the per capita consumption of seafood in the United States is one quarter that of poultry, it has been re steadily rising over the past decade. Since 1982, it has risen from 12.9 pounds per capita to an all-time record of 15.4 pounds in 1987. While per capita consumption dropped to 15 pounds in 1988, we believe that this reduction reflects lower levels of imports and record exports rather than a reversal in the global trend of increased consumer demand for seafood. Consumer awareness and interest in the health benefits of seafood in recent years has fueled much of the increased consumption. However, we are beginning to hear increasing complaints about mislabeling and other fraudulent practices poor quality, and in some cases, unwholesome product. These complaints apply to both domestic and imported products. They come from a wide range of persons, from consumer advocates, from fishermen and others in the industry, and from retailers and other users of seafood. Questions are also being raised by foreign public health officials and buyers about the wholesomeness of U.S. seafoods and the conditions under which they are harvested and processed. The media has focused international attention on the serious problems of polluted beaches, ocean dumping, chemical contaminants, parasites, unsafe shellfish growing waters, and naturally occurring toxins, both in the United States and abroad. Consequently, there is a growing public concern about the safety and acceptability of our seafood pr production and supplies. In determining what, if any, additional federal intervention is appropriate, the decision should be based on issues of public safety, consumer confidence, and a domestic seafood industry operating in highly competitive domestic and world markets. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the prepared testimony which I have submitted for the record uh, will take approximately 17 pages. Uh, mindful of your request in your letter to testify, I would propose to uh, restrict my testimony to the three areas which, uh, on which you asked me for specific uh, testimony. I, I will, of course, be able to answer questions. I think that would be very that. helpful, and without objection, your entire statement will be inserted in the record, as will the statements of all of our witnesses today, and we will recognize you for your summary. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Brennan. The inadequate monitoring of contaminants in seafood and assessing their human health impacts are weaknesses in our current system. You've heard other witnesses testify to that fact, and I agree with that. While not necessarily imposing immediate public health problems, impacts of long-term contaminant exposure through seafood con consumption need to be better defined and managed. This is of particular concern, as has been mentioned earlier, to individuals dependent for dietary protein on fish obtained through recreational 
or subsistence fishing. Because these types of fishing normally take place in coastal areas most susceptible to pollution, these individuals are at particular risk from long-term exposure to unacceptable contaminants in fish. Probably the two greatest distinctions between the fishing industry and, and food production from land-based agriculture are that, first of all, marine fishery resources are predominantly hunted and harvested in the wild state. The harvesters have very little control over the area in which, from which they harvest the fish. And we have uh, the harvesters uh, in excess of 100,000 vessels. Uh, last count, 128,000 vessels doing this harvesting. This creates peculiar problems for this industry. Secondly, instead of dealing with a, a handful of species that provide our red meat supply, there is a large number and diversity of species associated with associated distinctions in the harvesting, processing, and distribution uh, in the fishing industry. It is these differences which cause us to view the seafood industry as an industry in need of improvements fitted to the needs of that particular industry. In 1986, Congress appropriated monies for NOAA to initiate a model seafood surveillance project to design an improved system of seafood surveillance and certification based upon the hazards analysis critical uh, control point principles. And I was particularly uh, glad to hear uh, Ms. Haas endorse that concept this morning in, in her questions and answers. PASIP is an inspectional technique that is based upon the proper identification of the hazards associated with each step of production and their importance relative to the end use of the product. PASIP defines the control points for significant hazards and preventative measures to minimize those hazards. The production facility monitors these critical control points and provides to the regulatory agency records of its monitoring activities. Additionally, when a regulatory agency monitors the production facility or product and distribution and finds violative products, the agency examines the facility's records to determine how well the facility is performing under HACCP. And that, of course, is a critical point here in the HACCP process. It demands appropriate records be kept by the, by the industry. The use of HACCP as opposed to traditional continuous inspection offers a regulatory food protection system based on sound modern technology that can supply consumers with the safe, wholesome, and properly labeled fishery products they expect. HACCP offers the means for industry to use its knowledge and experience to help design and implement a system by which food safety, wholesomeness, and economic fraud issues can be resolved to the satisfaction of the consumer. Design of such a system necessarily involves participation by the affected industry. The system has proved most effective when accompanied by focused federal monitoring of in-plant ASAP systems as evidenced by the success of the use of this system in low acid canned foods by FDA and the United States Department of Agriculture. In carrying out our congressional mandate to design a program of certification and surveillance to improve the inspection of fish and seafood consistent with the HACCP system, we have classified the three, three potential problems in the consumption of seafood. Product safety, uh, food hygiene, plant hygiene, and economic fraud. Our initial efforts have focused on separating perception from the facts of seafood safety. Positive agents of public health hazards in seafood are either environmental, either natural or man-made, process or distribution chain induced. Data on outbreaks of seafood-borne illnesses co correlated by the CDC indicate that the problem can be managed. In an in interagency agreement with C CDC, NOAA supplied the necessary statistical resources for CDC to update their food Born outbreak disease data through 1986. According to the updated data, seafood is indeed responsible for 56 percent of foodborne outbreaks related to animal muscle protein, that is red meat, poultry, and seafood, where the causative agent was known. I noticed that uh, 
but your, your percentage comes out to 57 percent. I think we're within a margin of error and there's no substantial disagreement here, Mr. Chairman. Um, however, if you look at the causative agents, you will see that there are three specific uh, causes uh, that account for 90 percent of the illnesses. These are ciguatoxin, scrombotoxin, and illnesses associated with the consumption of raw molluscan shellfish. This implicates about 50 species of the 500 species of fish currently on the U.S. market. Ciguatoxin and scombrotoxin are chemical ideological agents primarily found in fishes located in tropical waters. Specific species sometimes related to ciguatoxic illnesses include barracuda and some groupers. Scombrotoxic illness is often associated with mackerel, tuna, and mahi-mahi. Illness associated with raw molluscan shellfish most commonly relate to the ingestion of pathogenic organisms either of bacterial or viral in nature. We believe that many of the illnesses with respect uh, to shellfish can be attributed to the consumption of illegally harvested products. In the case of both molluscan shellfish and ciguatoxic illness, these illnesses are attributed to contamination from either microbiological or chemical agents in the individual fishery product. These contaminations are directly related to the waters from which the animal comes and can thus be classified as an environmentally induced product safety hazard. These types of issues can be addressed by tightening harvesting requirements including a combination of actions, proper classification of molluscan shellfish growing waters, as has been mentioned earlier, identification of known ciguatoxic reefs, and stronger enforcement of harvesting regulations. In the case of scombrotoxin, it is microbiologically produced chemical agent that is caused by improper handling, most commonly aboard the fishing vessel. Thus, when these fish reach the shore, they are often already have started the process of producing the chemical compound that causes the toxic reaction when consumed. All of these issues, uh, all of these uh, problems, you will note, Mr. Chairman, relate to activities that occur before the fish reaches uh, the shore, before they're landed. In two cases, it has to do with where and when uh, the, the fish is harvested, in the, in the third case, the case of scombrotoxin, it relates to how the fish is treated once it's on board. Is it properly, is it properly iced or cooled uh, until it gets back to the, uh, to the landing uh, site? It's, it's very important, therefore, in, in looking at any system of, um, of seafood safety inspection to be particularly careful about managing the, uh, the activities at sea. Uh, currently in, uh, in the National Marine Fisheries Service, we spend uh, a significant amount of our resources in, uh, in ensuring that activities at sea are conducted in a way uh, that will make sure that the resource will be available uh, for years to come to the country. In the same way, if you are going to look at uh, at, at seafood, you have to ensure at sea uh, that the product is properly handled, that the fishing takes place at proper locations if you are going to assure that the product uh, is, uh, will, be, will be generally of good quality and safe to consume for the consumer. We have also concerns about the wholesomeness of products that reach the marketplace along with their economic appropriateness. In our model seafood surveillance study, we are addressing these issues as well as product safety concerns through direct industry con contact via HACCP workshops. It is through these workshops that industry has offered an opportunity to become intimately involved in the design of an improved system. There are a variety of issues that need to be addressed prior to deciding whether to implement a seafood inspection program. And these, uh, these questions are being considered uh, within the administration at this time. Um, should, should the system be based on HACCP principles and tailored to the needs of particular fish commodities? Should it cover problems from the growing waters to the marketplace? 
should it restrict through fishery management plans where appropriate harvesting of fish from certain areas to prevent the processing and marketing of unsafe fishery products? Should it provide for a system of registration and certification of plants and vessels for basic sanitation? Should it effectively address the issues of economic fraud? And this, this is a problem not only for the consumer, but also for other members uh, in the industry in the chain of distribution. Should it provide similar levels of assurance for fish and seafood products of domestic as well as foreign origin? In this context, it's important to remember that about two-thirds of the fish that we consume is in fact imported. And finally, should it provide uh, the necessary certification of export products to facilitate and promote trade of, in uh, fishery products harvested by American fishermen? It's our intent to deliver to the Congress a report that outlines a system uh, such as I have just described, an interim report covering all frozen and fresh fish, shrimp, and options for dealing with imports will be delivered to the Congress this October, and we expect a final report in December 1990. Let me just say a few things about how the current system operates. In inspection of plants and in the assessment of baseline acceptability of fishery products, uh, FDA and NOAA goals are the same. That is to ensure that safe, wholesome, and properly labeled fishery products are sold in interstate commerce. FDA operates a compliance program to ensure that seafoods are in compliance with the requirements of the F Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and other legislative acts. NOAA operates a voluntary fish fishery product inspection program. That is, a processor may choose to participate or not, but once he participates, the program is mandatory for a stated period of time and a contract is signed to that effect. In our program, we enforce FDA requirements as well as NOAA requirements. Our program is operated on a fee-for-service basis and provides implant sanitation and process, process control evaluations and product evaluations and grading services for affixing pack, packed under federal inspection, so-called puffy mark, and U.S. grade marks to, to complying product. Lot inspection of product uh, in warehouses, et cetera, is often requested and performed on imported, domestically marketed, and exported products. We also provide consultative ser services in the areas of plant sanitation, product reconditioning, specification development and review, labeling review and guidance, as well as analytical services and chemical uh, and biological risk areas. During 1988, our inspection services were used by more than 400 brokers in import, domestic, and ex export trade by state and federal agencies, and on a yearly average, 132 processors. The program inspected about 500 million pounds of fishery products in 1988. Approximately 11 percent of the product consumed in the United States was subjected to some degree of inspection under the USDC program and approximately 9% of our exported product was also inspected. The program augments its total staff of 160 people through the use of 11 state-federal cooperative agreements and four cross-utilization agreements with different divisions of the USDA. Under these agreements, an additional 60, 65 state and 97 USD inspectors are available to perform specific inspection services. We train and cross-license these inspectors and reimburse the state or federal agency for the cost of providing personnel from the fees which we collect for the services we provide to industry. These inspection activities are backstopped by technical and scientific laboratory support from several of our regularly appropriated fund programs dealing with fish quality and safety. Additionally, at the federal level, both USDA and DOD have roles in the seafood area. For example, USDA has the lead role in developing federal purchasing specifications and commercial item descriptions which the federal government uses for procurement purposes. Often these procurement requirements are adopted by state purchasing institutions. Additionally, DOD requires that any fishery product procured for troop issue must receive Department of Commerce inspection and DOD has established product quality audit, audit programs in that regard. The Environmental Protection Agency plays a role since it provides to FDA the pesticide residue tolerances allowed in fishery products 
engages in research to determine, determine better indicator microorganisms for use in classifying waters. FDA and NOAA have developed a memorandum of understanding to conduct joint enforcement actions against individuals that harvest molluscan shellfish from closed waters. Ms. Montero from our Office of Enforcement has provided you uh, documentation on these operations uh, earlier. Under another uh, MOU regarding research between FDA and NOAA, scientists from the two agencies are developing long-term research plans to address the most critical seafood safety issues. Among the highest priority areas are risk assessment and management of contaminants in seafood products and molluscan shellfish. We recognize that research to identify contaminants and the respective levels in the waters and fishery products consumed by the public is only one part of the puzzle. We must also know how these compounds will likely affect the consumer at various levels over time. Consumption data are also needed to determine how much of certain species or product will be consumed over the period of time in which the contaminant or toxic product will act. NOAA is currently carrying out research on listeria. The overall objective of this research is to increase the safety and marketability of ready-to-eat fishery products by identifying the cl cr critical control points of the processing of the products in relation to the survival and growth of listerium monocytogenes and to develop process parameters at th these points that will assure the safety of the product. The factors that contribute to the virulence of listeria and the genetic mechanisms mediating virulence will be studied in, in, this, in this effort. In collaboration with FDA and the molluscan shellfish industry, we are funding a study to develop better indicator organisms to assess the safety of shellfish growing waters. Finally, NOAA has been working with the state of Alaska and the Food and Drug Administration to implement a quality assurance program for seafood that may be impacted by the Prince William Sound oil spill. These activities include using Fishery Management Authority of NOAA and the state of Alaska to close areas to fishing where, where appropriate and a program of fish and fish product inspection to segregate unacceptable products. I have some good news here, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have conducted a, a study uh, throughout the Gulf of Alaska using some new techniques that have been developed in our Seattle laboratory. Uh, we find that the waters themselves uh, seem to be uh, free of uh, uh, PAHs, uh, the toxic residues that you might find in the water column from the oil spill. Uh, the danger uh, in harvesting halibut would be to, uh, would occur when either you have a dirty vessel, or you draw the, your uh, fish up through the, uh, through the oil that still is on, on the surface. We have, uh, we have uh, looked, at the, uh, looked at the fish uh, at several places. We find that there, is, uh, there are no uh, toxic residues in the flesh. We therefore, in cooperation with the state and the Food and Drug Administration, allowed the uh, harvest of the halibut to proceed. It proceeded. Uh, we had uh, a cadre of uh, inspectors from uh, NOAA, from FDA, and from the state looking at the vessels as they came into port and inspecting the, the fish and their cargo. And I'm happy to report that all of the product that was harvested uh, was, uh, was found to be free of uh, any oil contamination. The single, uh, the single problem we found in southeast Alaska was related to a diesel leak in the vessel itself, and, and the, the product in that vessel was a, did, of course, not enter the, the uh, chain of commerce. Um, we also had cooperation from, uh, from overflights uh, uh, spotting uh, oil slick and warning fishermen to stay out of those areas as the slick moved through. But that is an example, I think, of how federal agencies, state agencies to, can work together and combine the principles of uh, fishery management and uh, inspection to come up with a workable system. That system is going to be put through the test in the next couple of months as we, we will attempt to apply the same system to the harvest of salmon, chum salmon particularly, are expected to have a record run this year and we hope that we will, we will have the same success in dealing with that uh, with that uh, fishery as we've had with the halibut fishery. That concludes my, uh, my prepared uh, testimony, Mr. Mr. Chairman.
I thank you for the opportunity to make it. Friend, and the committee thanks you for your very helpful testimony. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. White. Thank you um, very much, Mr. Chairman. I had some questions to begin with respect to this a matter of harvesting contaminated shellfish. And uh, we've got an exhibit, uh, NOAA uh, exhibit, uh, America's Troubled Coasts. It points the areas which are closed or depleted <clears throat> of oxygen or contain high levels of toxic chemicals or pesticides. Mr. Brennan, could you tell the subcommittee what percentage of our coastline is now closed due to contamination or oxygen uh, depletion? Well, I think of, of, the, of the traditional, uh, the traditional uh, fishing waters of uh, shellfishing grounds of the United States. Approximately, uh, approximately a third of them are, are, are closed at some part of the year due in part uh, either to, uh, to um, effluent from, from sewage or, um, or uh, uh, inappropriate uh, planning uh, of, the, uh, of developments on the seacoast. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would ask unanimous consent that America's troubled uh, coast be uh, put into the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. Now, did I understand you to say, Mr. Brennan, that about a third of uh, our coastline then is closed due to contamination or oxygen depletion at some point uh, during uh, the year? Yes. Could you uh, be more specific in terms of telling us uh, uh, what contaminants uh, are involved uh, in these closures? Uh, yes, sir. If I can just get the document you're referring to. Um, as, as you can see, if you look at the, uh, at the chart that was prepared by NOAA's Status and Trends Program, uh, and actually picked up by Time Magazine, um, we have, we have areas of uh, oxygen uh, depletion, uh, areas of uh, high uh, PCB or pesticide contamination, uh, areas where we have found high levels of uh, toxic chemicals in fish livers, uh, which are an indication uh, of, uh, of pollution in, in the waters. Now, I should make a point here that uh, that some of the levels of pollutants that we find in the inedible portions of the fish do not necessarily mean that the fish themselves are, are unacceptable uh, to be eaten. What we're, what we're using here is, is, uh, is the fish livers, which tend to concentrate over time these chemicals uh, and, and as an indication of water quality. And this is an ongoing program that NOAA's been engaged in for uh, the last six to eight years. Now, you mentioned that through fishery management uh, plans, there need to be limitations on harvesting of potentially contaminated uh, shellfish. That's my understanding that's uh, now being done through the Interstate Shellfish Sanitation uh, Conference. In your view, how effective is that particular uh, process for dealing with these issues? Well, it's a difficult issue because what you have are 50 states uh, coming together, working with uh, the Food and Drug Administration. And by the way, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service does participate in this as well. Come up with agreeable, with agreeable standards and then have, uh, have all the states adhere to them. Uh, it, it, it requires some jawboning. Uh, it requires goodwill uh, on, the, on the part of all the participants. And ultimately, the final judgment is up to each individual state whether to comply rigorously and if it sees another state that is not complying rigorously, whether it will take action with respect to products from that state. Uh, it is not a system where you have uh, mandatory standards imposed uh, that, that the states have to live up to. Would you say it is marginally effective? I would say it is at best marginally effective. That, that was the way I wanted to characterize it, but I would rather have you do it, and uh, I thank you. Would you say that it needs better enforcement uh, as a general principle? I think as, as, far, as, uh, as far as shellfish goes, uh, 
there is need for more enforcement. And that, that's why several years ago, I act, when I was in a different position in the agency in the general counsel's office, uh, I, I moved to uh, use the Lacey Act to assist in the enforcement of this, uh, this activity. Do you think more meaningful civil and criminal penalties for specified violations of prohibited acts is necessary? We have, uh, we have a civil penalty uh, system that can impose significant penalties for each violation, $20,000 per violation. Uh, what we need, uh, perhaps, is more, uh, more effective enforcement in the criminal area because we cannot seize vessels and, and trucks, as I understand it, unless there's been a, at least a, a criminal conviction of at least a misdemeanor level. So we, at the present time, we can seize the, uh, the violative shipment. We can impose a civil penalty, uh, but we cannot seize a vessel or a, or a truck. We cannot seize a vessel or a, or a truck that's been involved in, in, unless there's a criminal. It, let me ask uh, further on that. In what instances do you think it would be in the public interest to be able to seize a truck? I think in those interests, uh, those uh, situations where we find a, uh, a group of uh, perpetrators involved in a concerted effort to circumvent the law and that the, uh, and the operator of the truck has knowledge of what's going on, then I, would, then I would seize the truck. Would the control of potentially contaminated fin fish through a program similar to the Interstate Shellfish uh, Conference be effective? Oh, I think that, that, that's absolutely out of the question. Uh, that, that just couldn't work. That would not work? Would not work. All right. Should enforcement of laws and penalties forbidding illegal harvesting of fish and shellfish be done under a federal or a state judicial system? Well, we have the, we have the situation here. I, uh, there's two parts to that question. I think that, generally speaking, there ought to be a, a per pervasive overarching federal responsibility since much of this moves in interstate or foreign commerce. And the fish themselves move between boundaries of states, and they move from the state jurisdiction out to the federal jurisdiction. On the other hand, I think it's clear that a, a great deal of, of uh, the fish that's harvested is, is harvested and consumed locally. So there's no question in my mind that we need an effective partnership between the state and the federal government. Uh, but I would not think it would be a wise idea to turn the entire program over to the state. Okay. Now, there's been some controversy over the use of the Lacey Act to prosecute uh, individuals who bootleg or illegally uh, harvest uh, the shellfish. Now, there have been some you know, objections, some uh, protests over the use of it in terms of these uh, prosecutions. What, uh, what is behind these protests? What, uh, what is this about? I have received a, 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 a letter from a, from a group of uh, represents uh, uh, the seafood industry and frankly I I was perplexed and dismayed to receive that letter because uh, it suggested that we should use our resources uh, under the Lacey Act to do enforcement for the typical quote unquote type Lacey Act violations migratory bird etc I my feeling is that a, a few bad people are doing things that affects the reputation of the entire industry. And my feeling is that not only am I doing the consumer a, um, a, a favor by vigorously uh, pushing the uh, Lacey Act uh, to deal with these violations, but I'm also doing in the long run the industry uh, a favor because most of the people in the industry are law-abiding. Uh, and, and do not go into uh, uh, closed waters to harvest and, and, and sell shellfish. And I was surprised that, uh, that the reaction from, a, from that organization would, would suggest that I should relax my efforts in the, in the area of, uh, of the Lacey Act. Uh, I, I think it's not in the long-term interest of the industry to do so. You know, my, my time's expired. Let me see if I can get one, one more in. You, we have uh, also been uh, very interested in the question of joint uh, FDA and uh, NMFS uh, cooperative kind of ventures and, and uh, shared responsibilities uh, in the future. 
Can you give us some specific examples of the type of joint responsibility that you would foresee your uh, agency and FDA going forward with in the future? Well, let, me, let me preface by saying that the administration is, has not yet uh, come to a conclusion as to how it, it thinks that uh, a, uh, a stepped-up uh, seafood inspection program should operate. So what I would give you is not an official position, but is really my personal opinion based on some experience I've had with uh, fisheries management. Uh, it's, it's clear to me that if you give a um, fish processor a uh, bad product because it's been too long on the boat with not enough ice or it's been harvested in the wrong place or at the wrong time, uh, there's nothing he can do in the most sanitary and clean plant in the world uh, to make that product good by processing. So what we have to do is to have the people with the expertise in fishery management, the people that deal with fishermen, the, be the people that have inspectors on boats, uh, perhaps not to find out uh, if the product is good, although we do have under our voluntary program inspectors riding uh, fishery processing, catcher processing vessels now. We ought to have those people who know about fisheries, who have dealt with fishermen, the seagoing people go to sea and make sure on a, on, a, on a patrol basis, not on a every vessel basis, make sure that the product is, is appropriate and, uh, and use the, the principles of fishery management uh, to make sure that the product that is do comes to the dock is, uh, is, is clean and wholesome and that the processor can, can then process it and put it in the stream of uh, distribution. I know my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time the gentleman has expired. Mr. Brennan, uh, I'd like to direct the attention of all of us to some matters relative to uh, what we would do with regard to a fish inspection program. I detect that Kennedy salt and stall grants are now being used for this purpose. Uh, they, by, by the states and by other entities. I gather, though, the total amount of money there is about a million dollars or less? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. How are the National Marine Fisheries Service's current inspections paid for? They're paid for by the processor, are they not? They, they are paid by the person who requests them. If a, if a processor uh, believes that he wishes to be able to put on his package, packed under federal inspection, he comes to us. We do a sanitary inspection of the plant. Uh, we come uh, and we charge him for the cost of the inspectors who do that inspection, and that allows him to stamp that on. Now, let me say something in regard to something I heard Ms. Haas say. Uh, I have uh, asked Mr. Billy to make sure that the process, the, the inspectors understand that they are doing a job for the ultimate consumer, that their, their, their work is to make sure that the product is what it says it is and is packed in a clean and wholesome way wholesome way, and that I, I have not detected any, um, any feeling on the part of the people that are doing the inspection that, uh, that they are in any way beholden to the inspector, uh, to the inspected plant. They're beholden to us as their, as their employers and supervisors and to the American people who expect that a government program will be run in an appropriate way. Thank you. Now, Mr. Brennan, you made a submission at the interagency meeting recently held at the White House. You proposed that a seafood inspection program incorporating plant and vessel sanitation and product labeling would cost about $90 million a year. Now, what did that proposal cover in terms of the kinds of inspections and the activities that would be conducted under it? Um. I was unfortunately out of town, but, uh, but we did make a submission. Uh, Would you want to submit that for the record? Uh, no, I think I can, I can tell you generally. Uh, 90, we've, been, we've been thinking internally, uh, and we believe a $90 million program would cover 
uh, increased uh, enforcement surveillance at the uh, uh, at, at the docks of imported product, uh, more patrol inspections, uh, a, a program uh, that the federal government would establish uh, that would allow for uh, state participation on a, on a grant or grant basis so that we could give the states an opportunity to participate in the program but with federal standards overlaying their participation. Um, and uh, to, to provide additional funds uh, to uh, the Food and Drug Administration to, to continue its program in partnership with us. Um, I should mention that we're talking a program on top of the current program, which if you add up all the bits and pieces from fisheries uh, and, uh, and FDA, probably runs another 40 to $50 million. We do do, we do, we do, do uh, inspection, uh, in addition to our, our inspection program for fee, there's a lot of basic scientific research that's done in other parts of NOAA uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, the Food and Drug Administration has, has ongoing programs and of course whatever the states are spending. Now, uh, Mr. Brennan, you've indicated that that would be done on the basis of a 1% levy on domestic fish harvests and seafood imports? Um, well, that was a, um, that was not a definite proposal uh, in the sense of, it, of, a, of a submission by the You're Department of Commerce. You're not in any danger answering that question here. We always interest ourselves in the well-being of our witnesses. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I didn't... I say you are not in any danger answering that question here. We always interest ourselves in the well-being of our witnesses, <laughs> as some folks down at FDA can tell you. Well, <clears throat> let me say this. Uh, we, had, uh, we had discussed internally in the National Marine Fisheries Service a levy of about 1%, which would raise about $90, $90 million. Uh, now, does this appear to be something that the industry would be would find acceptable? Um, I have not. Uh, I have talked to the industry, and I, I, I find not a great deal of support for that, Mr. Chairman. As a uh, as a major exporter of seafood, we do export seafood, do yes, we sir. not? Yes, sir. One of our problems in terms of our exports is our inability to demonstrate that they have been properly inspected by the government, is it not? That is, has not been a great problem in the past, but it certainly is one that we are hearing more about from the uh, EEC. Uh, they are beginning to ask questions about where is, where is the federal government's certification. And, and uh, so uh, I think that's a, uh, a problem that is starting to, uh, starting to occur. Uh, it is not, I can't say that it's a major problem at this time, uh, but it is a problem that is, is becoming apparent and will probably grow. We have, we have in particular, with the respect to Canada, uh, the free trade agreement, uh, which, will, which will require us ultimately to have uh, some sort of compatible and mutually acceptable standards. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's an area that, uh, that does deserve, I think, uh, more immediate attention. You mentioned the possibility of mandatory registration and certification of vessels and plants. Uh, what was the response of the small fishermen to this particular proposal? Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I believe that some of the small fishermen uh, uh, would not find that um, uh, particularly uh, a, a good system. But I did, I did think that, generally speaking, uh, people I've talked to in industry, generally, and without regard to whether it's small or large, felt that that was an appropriate, uh, appropriate step. I think people do realize that you have to look at the vessel as well as the onshore processing plant. Now, I'm going to uh, submit questions to you for the record with regarding to uh, this particular program and also the uh, hazardous analysis critical control point concept, uh, which I think may be useful for us to understand more fully. Uh, 
Are there any plans, however, for in, in implementing the HACCP program for imports and, ex and exports? Uh, what, what, uh, as what we plan to do is to, uh, is to provide the Congress uh, a, an interim report this, uh, this fall, and in December of 90, we will have a, uh, a final report. That report will be very comprehensive. It will cover uh, all of the uh, segments of the industry that deserve a, uh, a special attention. It will cover uh, vessels as well as, uh, uh, as processing plants and distribution. And I think it will provide a very sound uh, basis for any type of, uh, of uh, inspection system that will assure the, uh, the, the uh, consumer of the safety and wholesomeness of, of the uh, product. And frankly, I think it's a good thing that Congress has asked us to do this study uh, a, a couple of years ago because it has turned out, although it's, it's very, very detailed and very scientific, it is taking us several years. So I, I think that the culmination of this study it probably is, is a timed about right. And uh, whatever happens, it will be very useful uh, if Congress decides to move ahead in this, in this area. Now, do you want to comment on an HACCP program for imports and exports, and whether it would be desirable? Well, clearly, uh, since we're, we're uh, importing almost two-thirds of the, of the fishery product that we eat, we're, we're going to have to have some system that will assure us reciprocally that, uh, that the product from foreign countries lives up to, uh, to the minimum standards that we've established for our own uh, seafood producers. So I think that would be important, and I think uh, the HACCP uh, approach uh, is, is the best scientific and least expensive way to do it. Now, I I've, I've understand that there's some controversy over the use of the Lacey Act. Uh, is there any question in your mind that the Lacey Act covers illegal harvesters of shellfish or any violation with regard to transportation of shellfish in, in interstate commerce in violation of the law, either from which the fish and wildlife originates or uh, to the point where it is marketed? Absolutely none. Either the receiving state or the harvesting state. If it's in violation of either of those laws, it, it, it violates the Lacey Act, in my view. I'm wondering if, if, if there have been changes in the interpretation of that statute since I used to be on Merchant Marine Fisheries, where we had quite a familiarity with it, as you'll recall. I recall, Mr. Chairman. Now, I uh, have some curiosity here about other countries mandatory fish inspection system. Just tell us for the record, if you please, Mr. Brennan, what elements of the other system should we look at in the development of a system for the United States? Or for that matter, mistakes that other countries have made that we should uh, probably avoid? Well, I think that, uh, that one country that we should look at uh, because of the free trade agreement and because, frankly, of the success of their program is Canada. Canada operates a system uh, of a partnership uh, between, the, uh, between what we would call the Canadian FDA and the Canadian National Marine Fisheries Service, and they operate it very well uh, for the benefit of the, uh, of the consumer, from the benefit of their export market, and frankly, for the well-being of their industry. Um, uh, I... Um, I don't think that I could give you examples of uh, a system in another country that is that is fatally flawed and, and that I and that I, I, I feel great concern about. Uh, although uh, there is obviously product that comes into the United States which is which is uh, doesn't meet our standards and uh, and is turned back at the border. Are there problems of economic fraud like mislabeling? Uh species or labeling one species as another because of higher value, is that, a, is that an, economic an economic fraud problem that should trouble us? Yes, sir. I've, um, um, uh, I've, I've uh, seen uh, and heard of instances where there have been uh, species substitution uh, uh, for uh, red snapper, for example. Uh, there are a, a variety of snapper, vermilion snapper, which which demands about a, pound, a dollar a pound less. Uh, it's hard to tell when it's a fillet whether it came from vermilion snapper or a red snapper. Uh, and I've, uh, our people uh, can, through electrophoresis, can uh, can tell you the difference, uh, even from a 
a fillet. Uh, we have had requests from uh, public interest groups to do some studies on uh, some of these uh, products, and uh, the results have indicated uh, that uh, there, there is substitution going on. Now, this I don't know how widespread this is. There's, there are also problems with overglazing, uh, uh, put, putting an, an extra layer of uh, ice on the, on the fish and, and counting it into the weight uh, at 8 or $9 a pound retail. It's, uh, that's a big difference if you've got to pay well, that much you, for water. It's also a fact if you label one species as another, you may, you may uh, require a different kind of treatment in terms of storage, refrigeration, things of that kind, uh, then, then the species would uh, require if properly labeled or properly marketed. That could lead to some safety and health problems for the consumer, could it not? That, that, it's certainly conceivable that, uh, that, a, that a person might be uh, allergic to uh, a certain species of fish and, and, uh, and getting it unknown could cause some problems, yes. So you'd have a possibility of allergy, uh, allergic reactions, but you'd also have, you'd also have a situation where um, one species of uh, fish might be more delicate and require much more careful treatment in terms of, red, of uh, refrigeration and, and uh, shelf life and things of that kind than might another, might another species. Isn't that right? I, I believe that probably is true, Mr. Chairman, yes. Very good. Um, thank you. Gentleman from Oregon? Yeah, just a couple of other questions. I gather, uh, Mr. Brennan, that there are other kinds of economic frauds as well. I, I've heard of something over glazing or some, something like that. Yes. What, that what is that? That's well. What 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 a uh, in the fish industry when you have a uh, a piece of fish that's uh, let's say filleted or maybe not even filleted, but a piece of fish, in order to make sure that it retains its uh, its quality for a longer uh, period, uh, what what you do is you spray a fine layer of water on on the fish and then it freezes and freezes it, so it forms a well, more or less of a protective coat that delays uh, and, and keeps it fresh longer, let's say. Um, the reputable course of action is to charge only for the fish and not for the glaze. Um, but in some, in some cases, there have been situations where uh, instead of putting one, they put two or three coats of this icing uh, on the fish and then charge the total weight of the fish plus the icing, and that's what's that's what's called overglazing. Are there other uh, economic frauds besides species substitution, overglazing? Uh, I think short weight uh, substitution of product, overglazing. Uh, the, uh, the standard for breaded shrimp uh, uh, requires a specific amount uh, of, of shrimp uh, and no more than 50 percent breading. Um, Sometimes there is overbreading as well as overglazing. All right. Let me uh, just ask a couple of uh, of others. Aquaculture, of course, is a very, you know, promising uh, development. Are there problems that uh, your agency has come to find with uh, with aquaculture that should be addressed in the various kinds of reforms that are being considered? Let me say this about aquaculture: uh, we are we are reaching uh, the limit for wild fish. Uh, the amount of aquaculture product from, uh, from Norway, from China, uh, from South America has increased dramatically in the past few years. Uh, there will be more uh, efforts devoted to aquaculture, and that raises, uh, that raises questions about uh, feed, uh, what, it, what, it, what that does to the pond, um, uh, chemicals that might be used uh, for various reasons, uh, it raises a whole spectrum of concerns. Not that I have specific concerns uh, or that we are facing a great epidemic, but if we are going to move into aquaculture, there are things we have to look at, growth promoters and, and, and hormones and, and regulators and uh, fertilizers uh, and, and feed. And all of these things uh, have to be taken into account. And uh, we're not doing as much as I'd like to uh, at, at this time, and I don't know of any other government agency that's doing an awful lot in this regard. Do you, do you think some programs should be developed at the federal level to uh, 
address these, these aquaculture issues. I mean, it seems to me, and, and something you said earlier, again, highlights what this whole debate is, is all about, is that the vast majority of people are trying very hard to comply with the rules and regulations. And what we've got is a system where the scoff laws have a pretty good chance of escaping. They have a pretty good chance of going undetected and, in, a, in effect, uh, inflicting potentially serious harm on people. And here you have a, a extraordinarily promising development, aquaculture. You've said that you don't know what if much is going on at the federal level with respect to aquaculture. It just seems to me now would, would be a very good time to move in a preventive sort of way to okay. develop some programs in aquaculture. Do you agree? I agree that if, we're, if you're going to look at seafood safety, wholesomeness, and quality, you cannot leave out aquaculture. You really have to address aquaculture as well as, who, well as wild harvest. Who should be the lead federal agency in developing these new initiatives? Uh, well, that is uh, under discussion within the administration at this time. Let me just ask one other uh, question, uh, Mr. Chairman. I like, I think, some of the members of the committee and, and staff was particularly interested in uh, the Alaska uh, situation. And uh, we've talked to a variety of people, and I share your view that they have worked very hard uh, to try to deal with their situation. And uh, due to the spill in 87, they had developed an emergency plan for handling fisheries in the event of the kind of disaster that happened with the Valdez. My question to you is, do other states at present have contingency plans to handle, say, a toxic chemical spill or uh, another kind of disaster of that nature? Um, Mr. Wyden, I'm afraid I'd have to answer that for the record. I, I just uh, don't know of any, but I, I would hate, hesitate to say that the answer is no. You, you would hesitate to I say I would hesitate to say that the answer is no, but I cannot at this point uh, give you uh, other examples. And so I would rather go back and look at it and answer that for the record if I just, might. Uh, and I know you have some of your so associates well, there. Me, May, maybe they could just say, are they aware of whether or not a significant number of states have these kind of contingency plans? I mean, what, what I'm concerned about is whether you have a toxic chemical spill in the Great Lakes or another part of, uh, of the country. And my sense on the base of my inquiry and your testimony is that Alaska tried very, very hard uh, after that 87 situation. I'd like to know what's going on with the other states. Uh, I'd like to provide that for the record, if I, I, I may. I, I think we, uh, uh, there's some diversity of views here behind me. Some of your colleagues think yay, and some of them think nay. Some think, uh, some think that uh, they don't know. Others think uh, yes, some states and not others, but they, we, mm. we're not exactly sure how many or which ones. Well, let, let us leave the record open, and that's something that uh, I would like uh, further uh, uh, information on, be, because I, th I think uh, at the very least we ought to be prepared to deal with these kind of matters in a, uh, in a proactive sort of, uh, of way. And I assume that uh, with a state contingency plan, it would be your view that both agencies, uh, NMFS and FBA, FDA, ought to be involved. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Mr. Brennan, we thank you very much for your very helpful assistance to the committee. We appreciate your presence. There will be some questions which we will be submitting to you for the record. We hope to be able to respond to those for us, if you please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair announces our next witness is Mr. Lee Wedding, Executive Vice President, National Fisheries Institute. Mr. Wedding, we thank you for being here. Mr. Wedding, the uh, Chair observes that all witnesses appearing before this investigative subcommittee are, are uh, heard under oath. Do you object to testifying under oath? No, sir. Uh, you, are, you are entitled, uh, because of that, to be advised by counsel during your appearance here. Do you desire to be advised by counsel during no, the time you appear before the committee? Mr. Wedding, for your information, to inform you of the rules of the committee, the House, the subcommittee, copies of those rules are there before you as you uh, Sit at the witness table. Uh, Mr. Wedding, if you please raise your right hand. 
you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide. Yes. You may consider yourself under oath. Mr. Wedding, the chair is, uh, recognizes you at this time for your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have uh, submitted a statement which we ask be accepted for the record in its entirety, and we'll try to summarize it here in a few minutes. The hearing is rather long time in coming in, in our mind. Recall very well back in 74 when you did introduce and chaired hearings on fish inspection. It was really, uh, I think, the last time I appeared before you in a, in a hearing. Actually, the first time I talked about fish inspection was 22 years ago, about to this month, when a late colleague uh, Phil Hart introduced fish inspection because of a problem in Michigan. And at that time, the industry said we did not have objection to an improved inspection system, and we still don't. In fact, now we would very much like to see one legislated. We got busy with other things, too. You mentioned that in the 70s got busy with other things. Well, the industry did as well, and Congress got busy with extended jurisdiction, among other things, and with the 200-mile limit and all of the rules and regulations that had to be put in place for that. But since the time of um, the prior hearings in the 70s and the late 60s, fish has become a much more important part of our food economy in the United States. It's been cited here this morning that over 3 billion pounds is consumed. It actually is approaching 4 billion pounds of edible weight, almost double what it was back at the time of when Senator Hart introduced his legislation. And we note that the consumer today is paying around $30 billion a year for seafood products, which is a fair amount of money in, in anyone's book. The actual economic impact of seafood in the United States, both from indirect and induced uh, impacts now, is over $80 billion. And we believe that we are the generators of about a million jobs, all told. So it is an important part of our economy, an important part of the food industry in the United States. And thereby, we think it really deserves some attention in getting this issue of inspection and regulation into some semblance of order after all of these years. As has been noted here, there are some real problems, or some real health problems that come from seafood products, but we believe they are relatively small in proportion to the total and that the system does address these in many cases and has addressed them very effectively. But there are some that remain that need to have additional attention put to them. There are also a great deal of perceived problems which have to be addressed, and that's more concerned with the unknowns, the, the toxics, the contaminants, which have yet to be analyzed totally to determine just what type of health risk they do present and the fact that there is no single authority in this country that will stand up and say that the seafood is safe. But we're concerned primarily because the industry is changing. There are quite a few things happening now that will require greater attention from the regulatory authorities. First, there are many new species that are being brought into our market from around the world. And while this is an attribute in that we provide variety to the diet, it also does bring in the unknown in many cases. There is an emergence of processing facilities in the developing nations which need to be addressed because we're not too sure what just is happening in places like the Philippines, Thailand, Taiwan, and so on. And the system right now only calls for checking on these at the port of entry when the product gets here. We think the system must be changed to provide for procedures overseas as well. Aquaculture has been cited as a new area of concern, and we agree with that. It's going to become our most important source of product in the future. And we have to look at it in the area of medications and feedstuffs, all of which have to be monitored. There's new processing technology. Product is coming to the market now that is high-tech food science in terms of some of the combinations of protein from fish with meat proteins. So this is a new area of concern. More ready-to-eat, fully processed seafood is going to the marketplace, which means that our processing facilities must be subjected to greater controls for sanitation and procedural observations. We're processing at sea, which means that the plants are actually out of the easy access of the inspectors. The medical scientists are coming up with new bacteria and viruses, which 
do require special attention and new attentions. And then finally, we are concerned with the continuing degradation of the environment and what it may mean to the healthfulness of the product that is coming from our coastal areas. So all of this has prompted our institute to try to make something happen, and we initiated the congressional action in 1985, which has resulted in the study that is, uh, was discussed here by Mr. Brennan, and we're looking forward to that. We were hoping that this entire subject of inspection and changing the system could be done in a fairly organized manner in that we got the study started back in 1986 after the 85 Congress. We're hoping that it could develop the new system, really come to grips with the cost because it includes economic analysis as to what it will cost the taxpayer and the, the industry. We are hoping that the questions of healthfulness or the safety concerns could be studied by the National Academy of Science, which it's doing now, and separate the fact from the fiction on these so we knew exactly what we were dealing with. And we were hoping that all of this could be brought to Congress at the end of the study period and say, here it is, a recommendation to do something new and to put some comprehension into the system of seafood inspection. But it seems as if events have overtaken us in a certain extent, and we're now into the legislative process before the homework has been totally completed. But perhaps it'll come to grips and meet at the end of the, the term here with the study work being done about the time that Congress uh, feels it would be useful to start something going. The system that we envision is detailed in my testimony, so I won't go through it here. We have given a great deal of thought as to which agency we think should do the job, and there are pros and cons for all three of the agencies that would seem to make sense. They all have attributes. There are some negatives for each of them. But on balance, our institute believes that the best place for this program would be in the Department of Agriculture. We talked about paying for it earlier in the course of this uh, hearing, and the industry does believe that as long as the inspection system for meat and poultry is going to be paid for by appropriated funds, simple fairness would dictate that the system that would be legislated here be paid for by appropriated funds. Mr. Chairman. That concludes the summary of what we have to say this morning, this afternoon, I should say, and we're open to any questions you may have. Mr. Whiting, the committee thanks you for your very helpful testimony. Your entire statement will be inserted into the record, and uh, the chair recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Whiting. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Whiting, thank you very much as well for your statement. Chairman Dingell. Uh, discuss this matter of the economic frauds, and, and I, as, I as well am very concerned about it. Uh, do you think that there need to be stiffer penalties in terms of dealing with these economic frauds, such as mislabeling and uh, overglazing and things of this nature? We think that the, perhaps the penalties are, are adequate. Our concern with these at this point has been the relative inability to get enforcement. It seems that the the agency presently responsible, the Food and Drug Administration, has put a very low priority on economic uh, violations, whether it be in seafood or any other part of the food industry, and has chosen to devote its resources more to the health issues, which perhaps is the way it should go. But we'd like to see a more rigid enforcement of economic issues. And from where we sit, it seems that the need really should be for speed as opposed for what happens now if a violation comes to mind, whether it's reported by, by someone or a complaint is issued, it seems to take literally years before it comes to a head. And by that time, any, um, any impact from a, a penalty has been lost on the, on the industry and in that it no longer seems to be pertinent. And, and I gather it's that failure to move quickly that concerns you about a number of the things FDA right. do, does in this area. I, I gather that that's your concern with respect to how they handle imports as well. Our concern on, on handling imports is really purely economic in that it takes, there's so much money involved in moving seafood products internationally. The value of these products and the tonnages are such that a small importer will have um, literally millions of dollars tied up on the water. And when he gets to the port of entry, he really has to be able to either have it rejected or move it. And when it takes weeks to get something through a port, it becomes an economic burden. Just yesterday, one of our members, not yesterday, the end of last week, one of our members called and he was 
totally frustrated because he had a shipment that happened to without any ability to get any word whatsoever as to when it would be released or rejected. One way or the other, it could be done. Mm. I, I think that's a very sensible point. I mean, anybody who, who looks at, at the business sector knows that everything is about certainty and having some sense that you will get a decision, and, and that's one of the concerns well, it, I, I've got about, about this process, is that it just drags on and, and on in many instances. The, the dragging on is one thing, but commercial rejection insurance has a dependency on speed as well and rapid action that if you cannot get the paperwork in time to meet the re terms of your insurance policy you have lost the entire value of, of the shipment let me ask you some questions with respect to this uh, inspection uh, issue that uh, the chairman uh, uh, has asked about as well this uh, this morning what, in your view, would be the impact if the United States doesn't enact an inspection program for exports? It depends on the value of the dollar if you want to get it down to, to, to the real world. If the dollar is weak, we will continue to export. If the dollar is strong, it's going to be more difficult to export. And it seems very ironic that the overseas countries have their greatest concern about the safety of product when the market is falling and when the uh, it's going to be an economic gain for them to be more rigid at the port of entry so I think economic considerations more than having an inspection system are going to be critical to our success as an exporter however as was mentioned by Mr. Brennan we're already into hassles in terms of the free trade agreement with Canada and the ability to move product freely back and forth because they have an inspection system and we don't it's going to put a burden on U.S. exporters. And when the common market comes together in 1992, we are concerned that the, the combined regulations in Europe, the combined health regulations, are going to cause us trouble because it, I think what we're going to see is um, the most rigid of the community. And that is going to cause us uh, difficulties in exporting to that marketplace. So. Uh you, st you see Europe 1992, both in terms of what we're doing in inspection and what they intend to do in terms of their rigid uh, standards, causing us some obstacles we're going to have to work around. I have less concern over the product um, coming from Europe because the, the standards of the seafood shippers for most of Europe, especially the Nordic countries, which are prime suppliers, are extremely high. And they do have inspection systems in place, and the product has a tremendous reputation in the United States for its quality and adherence to, to standards. So I'm less concerned about product moving this way when the 92 uh, timetable rolls around. I'm more concerned about our ability to uh, crack the European market and move it through over there. Uh, Mr. Wedig, what particular areas in the seafood industry do you consider to be ones that could be potential health uh, problems. Well, any food can be a potential health problem if it's not handled right or if, or if the consumer uh, mishandles it. Fish inherently is a safe food, and I think it's been detailed pretty well here that, that we have three areas in which 90% of all incidences uh, accrue to, and, and they come down to the raw molluscan shellfish that is harvested from uh, polluted waters. The problem with ciguatoxin, which is pretty well confined to the, to the islands and to the um, territories. And then finally, the scombroid toxin, which is a relatively new phenomenon, which has come about mainly because fish that, in which this is uh, susceptibility have not been in the market all that long in a form that would cause them to uh, be a potential carry of the, of the uh, sigmoid uh, toxin. We've not too long had fresh tuna, for example, or fresh dolphin as a fish that is being harvested. And so it's new and I think has some things have to be taught to the fishermen and the dealers and the consumers about taking care of that product properly. Uh, since we have focused so much uh, on shellfish in, in particular, could uh, you describe to the subcommittee how the HACCP program would work for a, a product such as 
uh, shellfish. Uh, say you take it from harvest to table and just hypothetically walk us through it. Well, we would see the, the HACCP uh, program being employed in the, in the dealers, the buying plants for the, the shellfish industry. And one of the first critical points, control point, or the first one would have to be the verification of the raw material coming from open waters. And that would be the most important uh, part of HACCP for, for the Molluscan shellfish industry. And after that, you would have critical control points, most likely for the refrigeration of the product. Beyond that, there aren't too many things that one would be concerned with with unprocessed uh, shellfish other than those two critical control points, the verification of the source plus the maintenance of the refrigeration. Would objective uh, criteria be established in an inspection? Objective criteria? Yeah. I'm not too sure what you mean by that. Say specific standards. Uh, Oh, well, yes, there are specific standards now for uh, shellfish and for many other products, and we would see them uh, very definitely being hard, part of a HACCP program. Yeah. Let me ask you just uh, one other, if, if I might. Uh, we've heard from our witnesses throughout this, this morning that the tagging uh, system, uh, the tagging system used to identify legally harvested shellfish, in their view, is abused and, and abused fairly uh, often. Uh, how would you suggest it be modified uh, at this point to minimize uh, abuse? I think the most important thing is the ability to have meaningful penalties and more rigid enforcement. The operations that were described this morning really are too few and far between to, to have a deterrent effect. And one of the things that we would see in a new system would be a greater devotion of funds and efforts to enforcement and to rapid prosecution. And again, it comes back to that ability to prosecute and to have meaningful penalties. We, would, we do not want someone in the business that is violating the law by harvesting or dealing in product that is coming from closed waters. Do you think there ought to be one single system for tagging that all states would use? Yes, sir. And. Uh, then in conjunction with better enforcement uh, uh, efforts and, and stronger penalties and in effect one state agency focusing on it, then you think we could get a handle on this? I think so. Okay. Let us uh, just ask a couple of more questions, okay. if, if we might, uh, Mr. Wedick, and we appreciate uh, your patience. What role, in, in your view, uh, Mr. Uh, Wedick, does public education have in improving seafood safety? The, the statistics that we've seen about um, incidents of illness mm -hmm. would attribute, I believe, close to 70 percent to mishandling after the point of process. At least this is the record from New York State, which seems to have some of the more complete information. It is a very important part of this to educate both the consumer and the trade. And we're look, when we say that, we mean the retailer and the food service operator to, number one, be concerned about the source of the product, and then, number two, about how to take care of it to avoid the, any incident later on. It can be as simple a thing as telling a consumer these days that if you're going to go out and harvest clams yourself, make sure that you go to an area that is open by the state as opposed to just finding them on the beach and thinking they've, they've got a, uh, a nice source of clams. It comes back to refrigeration, concern over cross-contamination, which is not very well understood by, by either the consumer, in some cases the food service and the retailer as well. So education has to be a part of this. Who in your view ought to be responsible for public uh, education about proper handling and cooking of fish and seafood products? I think the responsibility does rest with the industry and with the government jointly. We do conduct extensive programs in this area now, but there's always room for more, and I think the government, uh, through such programs as Extension, uh, can have a great deal of influence. Tell, tell us, if you would, uh, about one of those public education uh, programs. I think it would be, be helpful just to have for the uh, record uh, 
a little bit about how it was implemented and to whom it was directed. And, and particularly, I, I share your view that this is a shared responsibility between the federal well, I think government. The, the, any number of them that the industry has performed, but the, the one that is most persistent has been an ongoing stream of, of news releases that go to the food editors of the metropolitan papers. And, and this has been the one vehicle that we have been able to use that would bring the message to a broad base of consumers when the food editors accept the material, of course. But every one of the releases will have the proper information in it as to how to handle product. We provide material in, like we call it master form, which is really a, a duplicatable camera-ready artwork that goes to the retailers for them to duplicate and to give to their consumers, particularly in the raw shellfish area. We have training tapes that have been developed for the food service uh, operators to try to teach them as to the concerns over refrigeration, cross-contamination, and so on, so that it's a wide variety of, of programs that are underway. Let me uh, ask you one question with respect to uh, the Seaford import uh, uh, situation, and, and one, one that I have felt is that the Food and Drug Administration ought to be moving uh, faster in terms of trying to get these MOUs uh, with, uh, with other countries. And uh, it seems the ones that, that we have can, can be very effective. And my question to you is, why don't we, uh, we have more of them? We receive fish and seafood products for, uh, from over 120 countries. But at this point, we have less than uh, 10, 10 uh, MOUs. Are there any particular obstacles you can uh, identify which are limiting the uh, number of MOUs? My understanding of it is that the MOUs with the foreign countries have been developed primarily in the area of, of raw shellfish, where the concern has to be over the monitoring of the growing waters. The bulk of the countries that send in product do not send that type of product in. They're sending in usually frozen uh, fish products. And the system has been aimed at monitoring that product at the port of entry because it, it can be stopped at the port and it can be analyzed or sampled and, and analyzed at that point in time. So that the, the MOU has not seemed to be necessary, even though there have been relations developed with some of the South Asian countries where those countries have certified that certain practices in their plants would meet our standards. Uh, we'll ask FDA about that, that, uh, that point as well, and it may uh, more properly be framed uh, towards them. What, uh, what's your assessment of FDA's uh, efforts in the area of microbiological uh, research? I think it is uh, the premier agency and has the greatest capability in this area. It, um, I personally believe they've done a, a good job in ferreting out the microbiological concerns. And it's your view that additional work uh, uh, is needed in this, uh, in this area? Additional funding for, uh, for work in this area? There are unanswered questions with many of the microbiological concerns. Uh, particularly the relationship of dosage to, to illness is one that does um, give us some trouble in that the mere presence of some of the pathogens doesn't necessarily mean the product is unsafe. And there is a lack of, of real solid data that would connect the, the level of the pathogen, the amount of pathogens in a, in a product to its risk. And a lot of work has to be done on that. Let me ask you uh, one other. Uh, the industry is going forward uh, with uh, these HACCP uh, uh, workshops. Uh, what has been the schedule of, uh, of those? How many? And uh, what is the status of uh, uh, the industry's effort in that area? My recollection is that during the past um, roughly 18 months that we've conducted over 20 of the workshops covering around 31 to 33 commodities, that Appears that we've completed all of the basic processing uh, workshops and are now looking at vessel workshops and some another import workshop is scheduled for later this month. But the, the bulk of the workshops have now been completed and the next major step is to complete the reports and testing the HACCP plans themselves. The, the first 
group of HASA plans for shrimp plants and for uh, fresh and frozen fish plants have been completed and the testing is, is going on now in the plants themselves to see whether what the HACCP workshops developed really makes sense. Yeah, what, uh, what has been the attendance at, uh, at these workshops? been a significant it's, it's level? It's been good in some industries and, and poor in others. The, um, it seems that the more advanced the section of the industry is technically, the better the attendance. And I suspect that that's a function of there being people in the more technically oriented groups, the ones that are putting out further process product where you have quality control managers and you have production managers and all those, they would be the ones who participate more fully in the workshops. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. The uh, committee thanks you for your very helpful testimony today. I'm rather pleased to see you remember the efforts of Phil Hart back in time some 20 years ago, as you mentioned, to deal with the problems that are associated with fish inspection and supplies of wholesome and desirable fish foods. The um, committee thanks you for your assistance. Chair notes that uh, it may be necessary for us to request your assistance in answering some additional questions for the purposes of the record. I'm sure if we do that you'll be cooperative and assist us. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much for your assistance today. Chair thanks all of our panelists for their very helpful testimony. The uh, chair thanks the gentleman from Oregon for having uh, had such an active interest in the business today. The committee stands adjourned until the call of the chair. If you'd like more information on this hearing on mandatory seafood inspection, you can write to the House Energy and Commerce Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee. In room 2323 of the Rayburn Office Building in Washington, D.C., the zip code is 20515. Coming up next, a discussion of recent developments in the broadcasting and cable television industries. Did you know that C-SPAN publishes a weekly newspaper? It's called the C-SPAN Update, and it's a useful companion to your...